Hello, folks. If you're joining on this room, this is going to be the session on uh, building recommender systems with uh, PyTorch. Hey, Gita. Hey, Divats. Okay, I guess we're able to share and we're our co-host now. We can just wait for others and I'll add the other presenters also as co-host. Sure, uh, that's great. Cool. And I think so we have- I will be introducing Sorry. and then playing the videos, right? Yes, and okay. probably if there's Q&A right after that, you can help with that also. Sure. And we have I, Jaspant yeah. Yella who just pinged me and he's our um, student volunteer who's gonna be helping us if there's any issues that we run into. Okay. Hey, just one. Hey, hi. Hello. Oh, I muted. Hello, hello. Hey, Joe. Yo. Oh, we got me, a lot of people on already. Let me make you a co-host also. Where, where are you? Thank there you, sir. You. There we go. Perfect. I'll probably space out when when I start talking because I hate watching myself speak so <laughs> <laughs> Do we have the other presenters? If they're logged in, I can make them co-host also. Just to kind of make it. <clears throat> Someone said they couldn't make it till I think two o'clock. Who was that? Uh, that a news can't make it till two o'clock. So I think a Monpreet should be here though. <clears throat> Do you see him? I don't see. No, no I don't see them either. Yeah, I don't Max. See yeah, maybe they'll come closer to their sessions, uh, which should be fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can pause the recording until the session starts. I see that it's already recording. Hello, everyone. Now, uh, welcome. Uh, you are on the Building Recommender Systems with PyTorch uh, KDD tutorial. I will give people another minute and then start. So the format uh, that we are going to use, we have all the session videos recorded. Uh, the team is here for Q&A. So we will play the videos and after end of each video, we will have a live uh, question and answering. So please ask your questions on chat on Zoom and uh, we will be taking up the questions. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Geeta Chauhan. I lead the AI PyTorch Partner Engineering at Facebook. And with me, we have a team of people from Facebook uh, for the recommender systems talk. Uh, so I'd like to hand on to Joe to introduce himself. Hi folks, welcome. I'm Joe Spizek. I'm the uh, product lead for PyTorch at Facebook. Divatsa? Hi, I'm Divatsa. I'm a research scientist with the AI system co-design team at Facebook. So I think other folks will join later in the session. 
So we are going to play the recordings of the videos and at the end of each video, we will take uh, question and answers uh, live. Uh, please ask your questions on Zoom uh, chat. Uh, so I'll start with the first uh, video now. Can everyone see the video properly? Yep. That's it. Maybe you want to crank up the volume, Gita. It's barely audible. Right, the volume seems to be very low. Uh, so, is the video audible? Are people having issues? It, yeah, can, the video looks fine, but the audio is very, very low. Hey folks. How about now? Building recommender system. Is this better? A little better. This is the maximum audio <laughs> I have. With PyTorch, this is a KDD 2020 tutorial uh, led by myself and a number of my colleagues from Facebook. And uh, today we're going to talk about um, you know what is PyTorch. Um, my colleague. You can't see the slides. If we're going to update on, on the core frame. Uh, so just want to check, uh, is video audible for people? We can't see the slides. Uh, so they can hear it now, but they can't see it. Okay. All right. Hey folks, welcome to Building Recommender Systems with PyTorch. This is a KDD 2020 tutorial uh, led by myself and a number of my colleagues from Facebook. And uh, today we're going to talk about um, you know, what is PyTorch. Um, my colleague uh, Gita and I will give her an update on, on the core framework, um, a number of areas around it, um, how recommender systems uh, fit in, um, challenges, solutions, etc. Uh, a lot of this is built around uh, DLRM, uh, which is a deep learning recommender model. Um, and so our, our, our friends in our AI systems co-design team, uh, Divatsa and Maxim, will be talking about uh, DLRM itself. Um, uh, Nerina will be talking about interpretability in recommender systems. Um, and then our friends um, who lead the multimedia framework, um, excuse me, multimodal framework, uh, uh, Amonkrit and Venonuj will talk about using uh, MMF for knowledge-based uh, recommender systems. And we will close with some thoughts and materials and a place where you can actually get uh, all this code and, and other uh, artifacts from this tutorial. So again, just uh, restating. So um, some of the, the folks that are involved with Maxim, and Vibasa, Amonkrit, uh, Narina, myself, um, Joe Spizak, uh, Gita, uh, as well as Ben and you. So uh, we are at your service. Hope you enjoy this tutorial. Um, but we just wanted to motivate things a little bit. So, um, you know, recommender systems um, are, are really, you know, fall, they kind of fall into this ranking algorithms category. So uh, when we think about search or personalization, um, they can kind of fall into that, that kind of general ranking uh, category. And DLRM is, is one of the more popular uh, these days. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they're also uh, a little bit different than kind of traditional deep neural networks um, that we kind of think the canonical CNNs, the CompNets, uh, LSTMs, or transformers. Um, yeah, these tend to uh, these days uh, be kind of a combination of sparse uh, features, but also um, you know can, can involve some dense um, features as well. And again, uh, we'll talk about that. But um, really, when we talk about these these markdowns, they tend to be these 
tennis, large, sparse, big embedding layers. Um, and they tend to be very difficult to train and expensive from a uh, memory perspective. Um, but overall, what we see is the trend is ideas are getting more complex. Uh, I know they are at Facebook. Uh, models are getting more complex. And you can see over time, just in this graph here, um, you know, how we've kind of seen things. So way back in the day when, when life was simple, life was, life was very easy, uh, decision trees were the state of the art. Um, and then things like sparse uh, linear regression, and then everyone discovered deep learning um, years later, and we started using neural nets. Uh, and then, of course, we moved on to sparse neural networks. And now we live uh, really in this world of uh, something even more complex. Um, and a great representative model of that is uh, the deep learning recommendation model, as I mentioned, so DLRM. So this is a model composed of both dense and sparse uh, features, and it's purposely built uh, for large-scale recommender systems. Um, it's also a uh, part of MLPerf, so if, uh, folks that are, are familiar with the MLPerf um, uh, you know, organization, and you know we're we're on that uh, that leadership and have some folks on uh, leading some of the the, uh, the efforts as chairs. Um, so this is kind of your standard recommender system benchmark. Uh, and so you can go to the repo in uh, MLPerf on GitHub, and you can see under training, you can see the PyTorch uh, sample implementation. And then, of course, you can go to Facebook research slash DLRM, and you can see uh, you know, the, the canonical implementation there um, by the team that supports PyTorch. So, um, so that's, that's the motivations and intro for, for the tutorial. So again, really glad to have everyone here and, and we're excited to, to be able to, to talk about so many really cool areas around this topic. Um, and kicking that off is going to be myself, um, Joe Spizak. I'm the product lead for uh, PyTorch here at Facebook. Um, and my colleague, uh, Gita Chahan, who uh, leads our partner engineering effort around AI. Um, so I will move on to uh, Folks, uh, just checking, can everyone hear the audio properly? Are uh, people still having issues with the audio? The audio volume is quite muted and there is a lot of background noise. Uh, Gita? Yes. Um, what I would like to suggest is that you reshare your screen. And if you then, before you pick a screen, you have the checkbox to uh, share audio also. Uh, so then you don't need to, then I think we have a clear audio sound. And if you then also could maybe uh, get your uh, screen to, to full screen, the video to full screen, then I think we have an optimal experience to uh, enjoy uh, the workshop. Okay. So I have the full screen already, and in the speaker, I have the uh, MacBook speaker selected. Uh, I can make it the external headphones speaker. Will that make things better? I can try that. I think there's a yeah. setting, though, in Zoom that allows you to select from your audio, because otherwise it's basically sending um, the audio through your headphones, I think. Um, so when you share, there's an option to select the audio. When you hit share screen. Okay. It's it's right so it's right at the bottom. It says share computer sound when you when you hit the share, like the lower left. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. into the agenda and we'll talk about what is PyTorch. So is this better? Is this better? This is great. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. So PyTorch fundamentally is, uh, you know, when you look at the mission, it really is about a research prototyping and production deployment. This is really what we ladder all of our goals up to. When we think about how we build community and really harnessing the best of the research world uh, or um, you know building products at scale everything kind of ladders up to this overall mission of, of basically enabling researchers to be as expressive um, and as uh, um, as creative uh, as they can but you know there is a, a portion of that research whether again that whether it's fair or, or other teams at, at Facebook 
um, or other places um, that gets into production. So we want to make that that kind of flywheel uh, as fast as possible um, to be able to take research and, and be able to deploy it um, at some type of large scale. Uh, and you know, the project itself is, of course, an open source project. You can look at it on GitHub. It's under github.com slash PyTorch PyTorch is the core project. Um, you know, we have, uh, I think, actually over 1,400 now um, contributors, I think closer to 1,500, if I, if, if I recall. Uh, so the project has grown uh, immensely uh, over the last, especially year to two years. Um, and uh, the community is really incredible. And when you actually drill down into PyTorch, like, what is it? I think that, uh, you know, I think for, for this audience, probably this isn't as germane because these are, you know, really experts uh, in the field. Um, but when you actually drill it down to it, it's, it's actually really a set of libraries and, and functions and, uh, and tools and other things that you can basically use to uh, develop neural networks. So it could be, for example, TorchNN, which is really just the, you know, your, your canonical way to uh, define a layer. Um, or your optimizer, um, or how do the how do you load data sets? So there's a bunch of utilities we have for loading data. Um, there is the the Autograd um, uh, set of APIs, which you know provides the auto differentiation. Um, so this is what you uh, this is all the magic behind uh, when you call lost up backwards. Um, there is uh, a, a set of domain libraries like TorchVision, which provide models, data, transforms, etc. And then of course. Really, the beating heart of how we actually ship models in production uh, in Torch.jit in our just-in-time compiler, and the uh, associated uh, language that we use um, to do that called Torch Script, which is really a Pythonic um, DSL, a domain-specific language um, that basically does not have a uh, global interpreter lock, um, and that can be uh, essentially shipped in a uh, a Python-free environment. So. Um, I want to talk at least a bit on the principles of the project. So, you know, we've kind of seen the overall mission, but how do we invest or what do we invest in? What do we think about when we invest in, in features around PyTorch? So um, there's, there's quite a few here, but uh, I would say these kind of hit some of the higher, higher order things that we think about. So, you know, we always think about eager and graph-based uh, graph um, execution. So we know we need eager mode. We know that we want um, researchers to be free to explore in this kind of Pythonic, um, you know, uh, defined by run um, type of environment. But we know we need to get into a graph um, at some point when, when you want to move into some type of scale. Um, we also know that, the, that the, the world is more dynamic these days. We've seen this uh, uh, the last few years with, uh, you know, control flow and, Variable length, um, you know, data, and and really just a you know, it's it's not it's, this isn't a feed forward static world. Um, things are 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 very dynamic, and we want uh, PyTorch to, to be able to enable that. Uh, we've also noticed, um, of course, that models are getting larger. So um, you know, if you look at GPT three at one hundred fifty billion parameters, um, and and even pushing beyond that with some of the more recent uh, models, um, distributed training, especially model parallel distributed training. Uh, is becoming more and more important as these uh, models just don't fit into memory anymore. So that's uh, an area of investment. Uh, fourthly, hardware acceleration. So whether it's cloud TPUs, um, better support for NVIDIA GPUs, or uh, the myriad of other hardware accelerators and, and devices that are out there, either in servers uh, or in, uh, in like on device, um, like phones or, or otherwise, uh, that this, is, this trend is not going away. Um, and so building clean abstractions and clean integration points uh, to support a diversity of hardware is important. And then generally, you know, when we think about new APIs, uh, we, we think about simplicity or complexity. So, you know, there's typically one way to do something. Um, we, we try and give as much thought as possible and, and talk to users, look at their pain points, um, look at usability and think about usability whenever we introduce a new API. And I think this has really paid off for us as a project. And so when we think about really developer experience, we, if I drill down on that for, for just a, a second here, um, there's three things that we think about. One is really that full freedom to iterate and explore, like, you know, whatever you're doing, whether you're trying to work in reinforcement learning um, and in robotics as an example, 
uh, or uh, scientific um, type computing with some of the newer APIs that we have, um, you know, it's important to give uh, users a, the, kind of that full freedom. Uh, second, again, clean and intuitive APIs. Uh, it should be very, uh, very uh, uh, easy to understand, like which APIs do you use, what, when to use them, uh, and why you're using them. And then thirdly, uh, you know, PyTorch is a core. It's one piece of the puzzle, but um, there are other things around it. So having a set of tools and libraries um, that accelerate you as a developer, so whether it's like visualization, whether it's deployment, uh, whether it's, um, you know, uh, full lifecycle management, uh, ML ops, et cetera, uh, there's a, a really rich ecosystem around PyTorch uh, that provides a lot of this uh, in the way of capabilities. So one thing I, I wanted to just get concrete with code for a second here um, to give everyone just an understanding of, of, of how this actually manifests within the project. So if you look on the left here, this is, uh, again, a very simple model, uh, a couple of fully connected layers, um, you know, and, and basically we are uh, using the, the Torch NN module um, subclass um, here. So basically we're using, uh, you know, NN.linear um, to provide our linear uh, fully connected layers. Um, and then we define a, a forward method, um, which basically provides, you know, the uh, the nonlinear functions and, and activations that uh, that are required, as well as your you know regularization um, uh, with dropout. Um, and so it's it's pretty intuitive, uh, I would say, in, in how you do this. But but that's not, this actually isn't really the important point of the slide. The important point is is really when you think about uh, how we've also defined like our C API, which looks eerily similar and that was of course by design so we wanted basically to have this intuitive api and whether you're developing in c plus plus maybe you're doing reinforcement learning uh for something like a you know high performance um uh gaming maybe you're doing something around like alpha go or, or open go like we did in our, in our fair team um where they use the c plus plus api um or you just wanted more seamlessly integrate uh your model into a c plus plus application um you don't really have to learn a new syntax um, and it, it really does allow you to kind of flow back and forth between the two APIs. And uh, you can see, um, you know, as I've defined the net, so net equals um, net, um, I load my data using, uh, say in this case, like Torch Vision, which provides a really nice abstraction for data sets, um, especially the vision data sets here. And I'm loading MNIST with a couple lines of code, uh, define my optimizer and then my training loop. Um, and of course, if you don't want to write a training loop, you can always use uh, one of the fancy, uh, um, you know, libraries like Ignite or PyTorch Lightning, which provides you a much more simple API. Uh, I think, uh, you know, more researchers and 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 um, and, and folks doing uh, more exploration like to have a little more control over uh, training loop. It's up to you as the user, whatever you want to do. Uh, in this case, you know, we're we're running. Uh, you know, uh, running a few epochs here, one to one to eleven, um, and uh, you know, zeroing out our our, our gradients uh, before we actually run this thing as a good good practice. Uh, running a forward, uh, defining our loss uh, using negative log likelihood, uh, and then basically doing a loss dot backwards, which uh, does a back propagation, uh, and then taking a step, um, and then doing a checkpoint um, afterwards. So very simple, and again, you can look at the C++ and uh, implementation as well, and it matches um, almost to the line. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, I mentioned tools and libraries, so this is only a handful of some of the ones that uh, they developed. If you go to pytorch.org slash ecosystem, uh, there's a number of, of projects, literally dozens of projects that we review, uh, and then we, we you know, we'll, uh, we'll put on the page, and, um, and these are projects that have a, a great um, you know, user experience, they have great documentation, um, you know, they've, uh, um, they have support in place, people are, are, are supporting these kind of longer term. But you can see, for example, some of the things like PyTorch 3D or Crypt10, um, you know, for encrypted AI uh, or, or Captum for interpretability. Um, these are fantastic libraries um, that will help uh, developers kind of fill out the end-to-end -end platform or help you explore different areas like, for example, private uh, private AI or privacy disturbing machine learning. So um, switching gears, I want to talk about the community. So again, this is 
such an awesome community. Uh, and one of the reasons that I personally am involved with this project and what gets me excited about um, really working uh, within, within this community. And um, so when you look at, uh, you know, some of the folks that are in there, um, you know, whether it's, it's Jeremy Howard or Ander Karpathy, uh, you know, our friends at Google, who we launched um, Cloud TPUs last year with uh, together, uh, it's, it's such an amazing and organic um, community that, that uh, has kind of grown up around the project. Um, we've also seen, you know, some, some, you know, players and, and others kind of join, join the party with us as well. Uh, while the project has a broad set of, of contributors and, and distributed ownership around the, the code, uh, a number of companies have, have also recently joined us. And you can see like O'Reilly um, comments around researchers and articles about how researchers are loving it, but also, you know, preferred networks um, in Japan. Um, uh, made an announcement and they're all in on, on PyTorch and, and uh, moving away from Chainer, which had a great community over in Japan. Um, and also OpenAI uh, has uh, recently joined in January and they're building all of their research on, on PyTorch. So that's super exciting. So numbers, um, just a quick, quick uh, set of metrics here. I mentioned like we're close to 1500 contributors. Uh, now that's actually well over 50% year over year growth. So the, the community just keeps growing quickly. Uh, we also don't tend to use uh, Stack Overflow for issues. Uh, we, we have a discussion forum. So if you go to uh, discuss.pytorch.org, we have over 32,000 forum users uh, with hundreds of thousands of, of questions and answers and comments. So there's this just vibrant community of, of users out there that are active and answering each other's questions and supporting each other um, and so on. Uh, and then, you know, one of the really interesting sites that's out there is papers.code.com. Uh, if you go to papers.code.com slash trends, uh, there's this kind of interactive chart that you can play with, um, especially if you're into frameworks and into developer tools. This is actually really interesting. Uh, it kind of shows over time uh, how many repos uh, have been uh, created um, based on paper implementations by framework. Um, and you can see PyTorch in red, so we're doing doing pretty well if you look at the graph, uh, which is really exciting for us. Okay, um, I'm gonna shift over to some of the things that PyTorch is, uh, as a project is focused on, and this kind of aligns with some of the challenges that we see in AI ML and, and some of the just overall trends that are happening in the space. Um, so, I think everyone has seen a variant of this, this graph, and this is of course out of date because of uh, GPT-3, um, and uh, as well as the uh, um, model that Google um, released that's in the hundreds of billions of, of parameters as well, uh, the uh, mixture of experts uh, paper. So this, this chart does get out of date very quickly, but it, you know, the, the point remains, uh, parameter counts are continuing to grow. Uh, this seems to be uh, a trend that just won't, won't go away. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's a challenge here is that actually um, deploying these models at any kind of reasonable scale is, isn't really tractable. So even BlenderBot, which is a model that Facebook open sourced uh, a few months back, uh, is, you know, around 10 billion. I think there's a version that's like 11 billion. Um, and uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, very hard to deploy. Um, uh, you know, this, this trend continues uh, and it's, uh, and these models just keep getting larger and it's very difficult to deploy them. Um, as I mentioned with BlenderBot, uh, at 10 billion, close to 10 billion parameters required uh, several V100 GPUs to even run any kind of inference um, for, for the model, uh, which is pretty incredible. So one thing that we've seen is, is really this, you know, this rise of model optimization and you know, whether, whether it's techniques like distillation or pruning or quantization, but the general um, ability to remove uh, parameters, you know, and, and prune these parameters, remove these parameters, or run these models in some type of, of lower precision um, is a trend that's been around for a while, but it's even more important now. So if you look at pruning, um, you know, this is an area where, uh, you know, you, you, you have these models that have just this, you know, over-parameterized models or hundreds of billions potentially. Um, and so, you know, how do you optimize that model? How do you compress that model down by reducing 
the number of parameters without sacrificing accuracy. That's a fundamental premise of pruning. Uh, and so we have an API uh, there, and we have a nice tutorial on PyTorch.org that walks you through that. And uh, Michaela Paganini uh, worked really great, worked really hard on this library, and it, and it came out great. Um, and that's that's available. Um, also, quantization. Uh, I mentioned like really, you know, neural nets historically have not uh, been sensitive to to uh, precision. Um, that's why we don't really care about things like you know IEEE 754 compliance. So, um, or, uh, or double precision or, uh, so, you know, this is actually an opportunity for, um, you know, for us to actually reduce the precision um, of our computations and be able to run them on uh, hardware that actually uh, supports basically lower precision, so something like maybe integer eight um, type computations. Um, and so, for example, um, you know, this could be IoT devices or mobile devices, but, it, you know, it could also be servers running at inference at scale. And you can see on the right here, there's an API uh, example, very simple one, um, taking Resonant 50 that we've actually pre-trained uh, as part of like say Torch Vision uh, and basically running um, some level of, of quantization based on a, a, config, a Q config, which I've had, I kind of uh, hid the, uh, the complexity here a bit, um, but you will configure basically how you want to quantize it, uh, what layers um, as well as uh, what precision um, and then be able to basically um, convert that model um, into something that can run at a lower precision. Um, and so, you know, what is the result? I mean, the result is pretty good. Uh, we, we've been using it at, at Facebook um, for a number of years now. Uh, it's never been really nicely integrated into a framework, but we're, and we're getting that now into PyTorch, and which really allows us to democratize it across the company and as well as externally uh, in the community, we're starting to see uh, great adoption of quantized models. And so, you know, concretely with something like ResNet 50, which is a pretty popular model and used in benchmarks and, and used uh, for a lot of classification tasks for computer vision, you know, we've seen basically a 2x performance speed up with basically, you know, marginal loss of, of accuracy. Uh, and same with MobileNet V2, which is a model that was built, uh, you know, kind of purpose built for mobile applications. We saw actually even better uh, speed up using quantization aware training uh, in Forex. And with uh, NLP models, we looked at, uh, for example, translation uh, using FairSeq. Uh, and blue score is, is basically a metric for, uh, metric for accuracy in translation. Um, we were able to use dynamic quantization in this case, so basically quantizing the weights only. Um, and we saw also a 4x um, speed up uh, using Intel Skylake. So, really incredible. And this is, uh, this can really uh, allow you to you know, scale on either mobile devices or servers um, and build efficiency. Um, the other challenge that uh, we see is training models at scale. So, you know, we think about the challenge here of, you know, things are expensive and experimental. Uh, in other words, like, you know, ML jobs are not like normal jobs. Um, you know, they're, they're not like building a data pipeline, right? These are, they tend to be ad hoc. Uh, we may do some checkpointing and, and uh, we may uh, uh, run a number of them, depending on the number of hyperparameters we want to run, and some of them may die, some of them keep going. So in short, these are, these are jobs that are basically atypical um, compared to what, uh, what, what is kind of standard um, in infrastructure. Um, and so it, the fundamental thing is that it actually makes it hard to, to do to, like demand prediction and control. Like how do I predict the number of jobs and training um, uh, jobs that basically my researchers are going to be deploying because they don't know and research is a very unpredictable area. Um, and so as a result, basically cost and efficiency is a very difficult thing to get your, your, your mind around. You know, how do you actually justify the ROI for spinning up maybe a thousand GPUs uh, and, 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 you know, basically occupying that compute for some period of time when maybe actually you may not actually get a model that's, that, that is high quality enough out of that training job. So anyway, so ROI ends up being, being very difficult, but also just generally like, you know, you have all this, this expensive compute, you have servers, you have uh, GPUs and CPUs, you have infrastructure around it with networking and power. Um, and, you know, when you're operating in this kind of sublinear environment, um, plus when you talk about the scale that say, you know, companies like, like Facebook operate or others, um, it's very, very easy to waste resources. It's very, and this could be millions of dollars and, and a lot of power and, and cost. 
So one of the things that we, we thought about is how do we do this in, in really this elastic fault tolerant way? And so Torch Elastic is, uh, was our solution to this. And it's really getting pretty incredible adoption uh, organically across the community. Um, and, and this is things like being fault tolerant. So if you're running, uh, for example, in a cloud environment, uh, and uh, you, you know, this is basically a non-HPC cluster. So if you're in a supercomputer and everything is, is basically uh, you know, kind of captive audience, uh, I have dedicated uh, servers, great. I can probably run with, without some level of fault tolerance. Um, but if I'm in a cloud and maybe I have preemptible instances, uh, like as AWS calls them, spot instances, like this actually uh, is much more difficult. Um, I may also have mission critical production jobs that I want to be able to run and I want to make sure that, that it, you know, it doesn't fail after a certain period of time. Some of these jobs can last for days or weeks uh, or even months. Um, also, you know, when we think about, um, you know, these, these spot instances that like, how do I actually, uh, you know, dynamically change um, and auto scale based on like, the availability. So if those nodes go down, um, but then they come back up. I want to be able to take advantage of that compute and be able to accelerate my job when, when that compute becomes more available. So that's kind of the premise of, of Torch Elastic. Um, but what if, what if my, my models are really big, right? If I'm running at really, really big scale. So this could be, for example, tens of billions of training examples. This could be, as I mentioned previously, models that are larger than the machine itself, um, or larger than, the, say, the GPU memory or even the CPU memory. Um, what if I'm running, say, hundreds of experimental runs uh, and they're competing for resources? What if I have a thousand plus different uh, production models? Like this is, this is what we mean about, you know, production or, or really large scale. Um, so one of the things we built is this PyTorch RPC framework. You know, RPC stands for Remote Procedural Call. And what this does is actually enables applications to run functions remotely and automatically handles things like autograd. So in other words, if I'm running on all these different uh, devices and I'm running maybe some layers over here, if I'm running layers over there, uh, or I'm splitting my model in, in different ways, but how do I handle this, you know, the, the auto differentiation as, just as an example? And that's what uh, PyTorch RPC handles for you. And I'll get into a little more detail in the next slide. Um, but first and foremost, what this does is it allows you to uh, handle these types of say parameter server uh, type approaches, or if I have, for example, reinforcement learning use cases where I see I have multiple observers streaming states and rewards to the agent, and I'm doing this kind of policy training, uh, or I could also be doing say distributed model parallel, uh, which is great for these large uh, sparse NN uh, type models, which is kind of why we're here today. We're talking about DLRM. Um, and of course the, you know, uh, hot wild training, which, um, you know, is, is, believe it or not, still used um, today. So just a quick primer on RPC. So there's really four things to keep in mind here. And again, this was like, it came out in PyTorch 1.4, which is earlier this year in January. Um, there is the RPC portion, which is really the user code with, with arguments um, and some specified uh, destination location. Uh, there is the remote reference, which basically tracks and maintains objects owned by this re uh, the remote workers. Uh, and then there's uh, distributed autograd. So one of the things that's historically painful is, you know, how do I actually connect all these graphs uh, and actually do uh, back propagation um, through that, uh, through the graph um, when they're distributed over a bunch of workers. So building an abstraction that basically allows you to connect all those graphs um, from those different workers into this, this global graph, and then basically give you, you know, something similar to lost off backwards and make it as easy as possible for the user. Um, as well as a distributed optimizer. So similar thing, you have an optimizer. Um, I, you know, how do I deal with that? Uh, the fact that I, I need to run, um, you know, like SGD um, across uh, all of these different um, uh, remote workers. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about deployment at scale. So this is one of the other challenges that we've seen um, in the PyTorch community. So, uh, you know, I think we've, we've been deploying models at, uh, for quite some time at, at Facebook. DLRM is a, is a really interesting model. It's a very uh, compute heavy model, um, but also it, it, it hits the memory uh, bandwidth quite hard as you'll find from Divatsa and Maxim's talk uh, later on. 
Um, but all, all told, some of the things that we've seen is really, um, you know, there, there's, there's a number of pain points of just deploying models. I think everyone likes to train models and talk about uh, authoring new models, but being able to, to deploy them at scale is actually pretty difficult. And some of the things we've seen is being able to just load and manage multiple models. How do I have multiple models on multiple servers, um, you know, maybe in, in multiple clouds um, or multiple type, type devices? Uh, how do I handle like running pre-processing and post-processing code um, around the pr prediction requests uh, and be able to do that pretty, you know, you know, in a straightforward manner? How do I log, monitor? How do I, how do I secure predictions uh, and have, um, you know, uh, a way to ensure that, uh, you know, my, my model can't be hacked when it's doing predictions. And of course, what happens when you hit scale? Um, and so one of the things we worked on with um, the Amazon folks, uh, AWS, is, is Torch Serve. Torch Serve is uh, essentially a model server, um, provides a, a set of APIs for inference uh, as well as management. Um, it has a uh, default set of handlers. So basically, if you're doing things like text classification or even segmentation, uh, you can also do uh, custom handlers. Uh, there's also the ability to version your models, roll back to earlier versions, do you know, auto batching. Um, across uh, HTTP requests, all of the usual like logging and metrics, um, as well as, uh, as I mentioned previously, a robust set of APIs um, accessible through HTTP um, for both management of, of your models, but also to handle um, you know, how inference is performed. And that is open source. If you go to uh, Py, the, the PyTorch org and GitHub uh, slash serve, um, you can find that repo. Okay. Lastly, I want to give everyone an update on the latest uh, for PyTorch um, and uh, the release that we have that, that came out fairly recently, as well as some ways to get started. Okay, so PyTorch 1.6 uh, released the end of July. So this is, uh, you know, we tend to do releases roughly every quarter uh, and then uh, so every three months or so uh, with maybe a maintenance release uh, in the middle, uh, depending on if we accumulate enough um, a lot, enough issues um, to warrant one. Um, this was a, a really, really good release. Uh, it had some, some nice and interesting features that are really valuable. Uh, so first and foremost, we added um, automatic mixed precision training. Um, and this basically allows you to take advantage of uh, some of the great features that NVIDIA has in, in their GPUs around, say like Float 16, uh, and be able to basically automatically um, you know, decide which layers in your network require higher precision and, and which ones require or can, can tolerate lower precision. Um, and this is a very clean API. It's very simple to enable in your model. Um, and it can basically uh, speed up your models, uh, sometimes orders of magnitude and reduce memory consumption. It's pretty significantly as well uh, because of the ability to, to use lower precision, like, like I said, like FP16. Uh, we've also added uh, something called TensorPipe, uh, which is basically a tensor where point-to-point uh, -point communication uh, set of primitives. Um, and what this does is, uh, in addition to the collectives that we support uh, in distributed, uh, in our, our backends for distributed training, we also now support a point-to-point -point, uh, backend. And, then, and this is what we're calling TensorPipe. Um, and then thirdly, we added profiling tools. So one of the biggest things that we, uh, biggest features we've uh, been asked for is the ability to do tensor level memory consumption uh, and be able to, to, to understand how we're doing uh, across CPUs and GPUs. Uh, and so that's supported now as, as part of the Autograd API. And then uh, fourthly, we've had just a number of overall improvements for distributed data parallel training as well as the RPC packages. Um, but what's interesting is actually we've, we've, we've implemented uh, the ability to actually mix and match dense and sparse um, uh, type of uh, training. So basically you can mix DDP and RPC now pretty seamlessly. Uh, and there's a new API that supports that. Uh, in addition to uh, the core framework, uh, we released a number of uh, domain libraries that we've uh, added new features to. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, you should know, um, we have really three main ones that we maintain and we are considering more in the future, um, but one around vision, so computer vision, torch text uh, for NLP uh, and so on, um, as well as uh, torch audio. And so uh, Torch Vision, we've added some new models uh, for semantic segmentation. So you can see, um, you know, the uh, FCN based on uh, ResNet 50, 
uh, dplab v3, uh, which is also based on ResNet 50 and both trained on the COCO data set. Uh, we've also added app support um, in Torch Vision, uh, which is really cool. So you can basically do auto casting uh, for models and operators in Torch Vision. Uh, in Torch Text uh, 0.7, uh, so we basically are re revising the, the uh, data set um, API um, to basically be compatible with PyTorch's data loader and sampler um, and added some nice uh, pre-processing pre defaults as part of that. Um, and so the, the revamp of Torch Text continues and, and we made a big step forward in this release. Uh, we've also added a new multi-headed tension module um, that you can basically have a high level of, of customization within. Windows is now supported. We haven't, we've been Linux only for a long time on Torch Text. Uh, we've also added Torch Script support for sentence, sentence piece models. Um, so it allows you to ship those in, into production. Um, and we've also added a pre-trained BERT example pipeline, um, you know, for a, a question answering um, type use case, uh, along with two Q&A data sets. Lastly, Torch Audio, uh, again, Windows is added as well. So that's great. We have um, Windows across the board. Uh, and then we've also added a number of, of new things. So we've added um, uh, new, you know, new models like wait for letter. We've added some new functions. You can see all of the new audio functions that we have, uh, uh, data sets, um, as well as uh, SOX uh, backend support for TorchScript um, is actually uh, available, but optional if you want to use it. So how do you get started? Uh, where are all the docs, where are all the tutorials, where are all the blog posts, et cetera? If you go to PyTorch.org, uh, you can always click on getting started. Uh, we have a nice handy little selector, select your version. Uh, select your OS, um, select your, your package management. Uh, if you want to use PIP or Conda, et cetera, it's all supported there. Uh, if you want to do any kind of like uh, any, any other learnings, uh, if you go to Udacity, most of their classes are built on PyTorch. We have, of course, an intro to deep learning PyTorch course that's free. Um, there are uh, a number of other courses. There are computer vision, nano degree, um, privacy and AI. All of that is built on PyTorch which is uh, really awesome and really useful. Uh, there's also a number of books. So I'm just kind of showing a couple here, but uh, whether it's, uh, you know, Dilip Rao's Natural Language Processing with PyTorch that came out last year, or Eli and Luca's book on deep learning with PyTorch. And if you go to pytorch.org, it's actually free. You can download the PDF with basically a very simple form. I think they ask you your name and what you're going to build with PyTorch. Um, and that's about it. I'm not even sure they asked your name, <laughs> um, but it's a very simple form um, and you can get a, a really nice book for free. And it is a fantastic book. I was a reviewer on it as, as were uh, a number of the PyTorch uh, core devs. Um, and Fast.ai is uh, also a great resource and Jeremy's book, um, his new book is coming out uh, in about a month or so here. Um, at the time of this recording, it was about a month out. I think it's in, in August, early August that it comes out. Uh, and that'll be on Amazon. Um, uh, through O'Reilly, so I would definitely check that out. And of course, his MOOCs um, that he puts out. Uh, we also have docs in Chinese. So if you go to pytorch.apachecn.org, uh, you can uh, see uh, a lot of the, the docs and tutorials in Chinese, which is nice. Uh, and then we have a fantastic community in Korea, uh, and they've done a great job of, of basically translating pretty much everything over into Korean, and that's pytorch.kr. And if you want to follow us and, and, you know, keep in touch and learn about what we're up to, uh, you know, we, we, we're on PyTorch.org, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube uh, with lots of great videos. Uh, of course, we're on Facebook. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting is our medium.com slash PyTorch channel. Uh, I think we posted something like close to 40 blogs in the last uh, month or so with uh, most of those from the community uh, around new libraries, um, you know, new tools, uh, all kinds of, of new information, um, and uh, kind of great walkthroughs to get you started in a number of areas. So I would definitely uh, go to that Medium channel, subscribe to it, and, and you know read some of the blogs. They're really useful. OK, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Gita, uh, to take us home on PyTorch, on the PyTorch section, talk about recommender systems, the state of the world, um, you know what, uh, what are the challenges are, what the solutions are, and I'll hand it off to her. Thank you, Gita. Thanks, Joe. My name is Gita Johan. I lead the AI PyTorch Partner Engineering Group at Facebook. 
I will now go into details of recommender systems, their unique challenges, and the current state of the art for building recommender solutions. At Facebook, we use recommender systems for many of our services, like the newsfeed ranking, the stories ranking, and the Instagram explore. At Facebook, recommender models comprise of almost 50% of all our AI training cycles and 80% of AI inference cycles in our compute clusters. Meanwhile, if we look at the research community, the papers published in top systems conferences in the past four years, things look much different. So there is a big disconnect between the areas where the researchers are focusing and what is needed by the industry. In order to understand the problems, let's start by looking at what recommender systems do at a high level. At Facebook scale, we are dealing with hundreds and thousands of items and we have to decide how to rank these in order to make a prediction to show something to the user. So we start off with these candidate items and pass them through the recommendation models that have billions of parameters and get a ranked list which goes out to the users. On top of that, the scale of Facebook's users is in billions. So you have an enormous number of these predictions happening at data center scale in parallel. Diving into how recommender systems work from an algorithmic standpoint, we see that there are a set of continuous dense features like the age and time of day and a set of categorical sparse features like the user's search history and the pages she visited and the book's genre. The dense features represent questions for which there is a concrete answer. And the sparse features are for range of yes and no type of questions which are related to the user or for the items being recommended. Now these sparse features are encoded into embedding tables which are then integrated with the dense features to get to a prediction with percentage score for each of the items. And finally, we create a ranked list of recommendations of what a user may like. When it comes to evaluating the recommender models, there are a couple of things we need to keep in mind. First of all, it is widely known that ranking more items leads to better recommendations. So from a system standpoint, we focus on high throughput to evaluate lots of different candidate solutions all at once. And since we have a user waiting at the other end, we have a firm latency requirement. Otherwise, the user will abandon the site and go somewhere else. So what this means is that from an optimization point of view, we focus on latency bounded throughput for the recommendations. This poses some unique challenges for building recommender systems and they fall under three main categories. The embedding tables, the model heterogeneity and the performance variance. Embedding tables are an order of magnitude larger compared to the CNN, RNN and fully connected models. However, when we look at the compute intensity side, their requirements are much lower, so they need fewer flops per bytes. Due to the sparse nature of the data, the memory access pattern is very irregular, however, and this poses additional challenges. Within the recommender systems themselves, there is a wide di diversity. So if we look at uh, three key recommender models at Facebook, they all have different attributes. So different fully connected sizes, different number of embedding tables based on the task and the data domain. The size of the embedding varies. The number of lookups per table also varies. And if you start to look at the bottlenecks that get introduced by each of the models, and try to hone in on specific operators where the, all the time is being spent, 
that too varies widely across the models. So you can't optimize for any one operator that is generic for all recommender models. The sensitivity of the models on how they would perform on underlying systems also varies. So if we take an example, for the models are very sensitive to the configs like the batch sizes and its impact on specific systems. As a result, one need to co-design the models with the actual hardware on which they get deployed to get an optimal performance. Now let's look at the state of the art for building recommender systems. The solutions fall under three main categories. Personalization, API-based solutions like AWS Personalize, the frameworks and libraries like the Microsoft Recommender Library and the NVIDIA Merlin framework. Models and benchmarks like the Facebook DLRM model and the MLPerf industry benchmark for machine learning training and inference. Another key ingredient that was missing for the recommender space for a long while was a good open set of data sets. And the Critio ads data set closed this gap and now opens up doors for the research community to experiment and build new models similar to what happened for the CNN and the RNN space. So let's hone into a couple of these. So here is an example of AWS Personalize, uh, which is based on AutoML. In this case, the domain experts upload their data and tune a few parameters. For example, they identify the features, select the algorithms, select the hyperparameters, based on which a custom model and an API is generated. The NVIDIA Merlin framework is specifically designed for recommender systems. It has the NV tabular for optimized data loading, the huge CTR for training and Triton as the inference server. Microsoft's recommender library comes with a wide range of pre-built recommender models and predefined data sets, including the Critio data set. Facebook's DLRM is now part of the MLPerf benchmark. And the best part of the solution is that it is fully configurable. So you can tune how many dense features you want, what is their size, same thing with these sparse features, or different layers, all that is tunable, uh, based on which you can do your research, run your research experiments on different platforms and get an optimal solution for your particular needs. So let's dive into some of the research tools for recommenders. We just talked about the DLRM, uh, which is part of the MLPerf benchmark now, along with the Critio ads data set, which includes both the Kaggle data set as well as the full one terabyte data set. We are also working with our ecosystem partners for optimized models and workflows. So for example, with NVIDIA, we have an optimized version of DLRM, which just got launched on the Ampere GPUs and has support for fast data loading with Spark on GPUs. A new distributed version of DLRM heterogeneous data parallel and model parallel version. The Intel optimized DLRM using their bfloat 16 solution. Uh, we are also working with Google for DLRM on TPUs and uh, reference architectures for Azure and AWS are also coming out soon. On papers with code, you can find the state-of-the-art models and papers with actual code, which can give you a jump start for your research. Finally, with the PyTorch 1.6 release, we added support for building heterogeneous DDP and RPC models. So you can now use DDP for your dense features and DMP for your sparse features where your embedding tables do not fit into a single uh, machine. So I hope I got the message across on the importance of recommender systems. They are underinvested, have unique system challenges, and now with the benchmarks and data sets, 
doors have been opened for you all to innovate and do novel research for new types of systems of the future. I would like to leave you with few references. And in the next section of the tutorial, Maxim and Dhivatsa will dive deeper into DLRM. Thank you very much. Yeah. So welcome everyone. I'll uh, pause here for some uh, questions. I see that there are a few questions from the community. We've been answering them uh, as well on chat. Uh, so there was a question uh, on the embedding, uh, sorry, the feature embeddings, feature column cut categorical column support. So at present, uh, the direct support is not there in uh, PyTorch, but we do have uh, support for extensions using the embedding bag uh, operators. Any other questions? Can people turn on their microphone if they want to ask questions? Jashwant, is that an option? I think we can ask them to unmute. Yeah, if people have questions and you would like to ask live, please unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, there was another question on the DLRM. Does it have its own inbuilt model? So yes, DLRM is a model. Uh, the beauty of the model is that it is fully configurable. So you can, uh, when you train your model, you can define uh, how many sparse and the dense features you want. And uh, based on that, you can actually get your trained model. So it is a configurable model, I would say. And uh, it allows you to do a lot of research. And that. that's how we use it at Facebook as well. The lecture slides will be posted on the GitHub. Uh, they're already live on the KDD site if people have access to it. So I, after the talk, we will publish them on GitHub as well, uh, along with the videos. There's another question on uh, does DDP features mean dense embedding features? So DDP stands for distributed data processing. Uh, do we have anything special? For distributed data embedding? parallel. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. distributed data parallel, sorry. So for embeddings, do we have anything special? Viewers? So in embeddings, the PyTorch has embedding bag operator which supports embeddings. And then uh, in the next talk, we'll talk about how we can do model parallelism or data parallelism with these embedding bag operators. So Divats, there's also one more question on the embedding bag operators. So people are asking, uh, how does it help reduce the embedding table size? So embedding bag essentially is an operator for an embedding lookup, right? That's the stock operator. We have extensions which we built out in PyTorch DLRM. Since reducing embedding bag sizes is a key requirement since they're the larger component of the model. We'll talk a lot about a bit, a bit more in detail about it in the next talk. Probably we can defer this question after the next presentation. And if there are more questions, uh, if there are further follow-ups, we can kind of tend to it right after that next video. Okay, so looks like no more questions. So let's jump to the next video. So this will be the talk uh, from uh, Dhivats and uh, Maxim on the DLRM model. Hi, welcome everybody. This is the second talk of the tutorial where we'll be talking about building recommender systems. 
importance of recommender systems and how this can be built using PyTorch. And as an example or a case study, we'll be going over Facebook's DLRM or the deep learning recommendation system and how we've done this in PyTorch. This talk uh, will be given by myself, I'm Divat Samudigere from Facebook AI system co-design team and my colleague, Maxim, from the same team. Before we go into details of the DLRM and recommendation systems in general, just to step back and summarize um, why PyTorch. A lot of details was covered, were covered in the, the talk uh, just prior to this with Joe and Geeta. But just to summarize again, the key benefits of PyTorch are essentially founded in its programming model, which supports eager and graph-based execution. This allows for fast experimentation where different types of models, algorithms can be tested on the fly and experimented with and based on input from experiments can be changed or adapted to finally arrive at a working solution. This is very helpful, especially when looking at machine learning or deep learning, where which is an iterative process in terms of uh, the model building or trying out algorithms itself. And although this provides a capability to use dynamic neural networks, this might not necessarily be used in for models that are dynamic, but the iterative process that I dis just described as is to how we can create a model, iterate over it and refine becomes something that's very helpful in some sense. What PyTorch successfully achieves is while providing this flexibility, it also ensures there's enough support for performance, computational performance, being with support for distributed training, providing support for a, a efficient data parallelism, trying, being able to scale on different types of uh, hardware platforms, including uh, with CPUs, GPUs, and also the recent support for TPUs, and ensuring that we can actually scale this out while we do these experimentation, do this in a faster turnaround time, finally leading to the key results. And overall, the underlying guiding principle for PyTorch has been to prioritize simplicity over complexity, which has been the key driver in its adoption or in its uh, staggering increase in popularity over the last couple of weeks, uh, last couple of years. So let me pause here and just try to figure out how to get the full screen. So we at Facebook, we have ML or AI used for a variety of services. And for us, PyTorch is the chosen framework that is used for these applications. Majority of them already use PyTorch and the ones that they don't are moving or act actively being migrated to PyTorch. But before that, let's try to talk about what ML is and how it is at Facebook. A key, when I talk about ML, uh, just to provide a, uh, a disclaimer, I'm going to use ML deep learning AI interchangeably. And there is a semantic to it, but just to provide, co co convey the concept. Here at Facebook, we used ML across a variety of applications, ranging from integrity with visual understanding, neural machine translation, and recommendation and ranking. And the key reason or the benefit of ML, the wider community has been its ability to be able to deal with large amounts of data while learning with large amount of data, still extracting useful information and provide benefit in terms of accuracy. The plot here on the right is an example from a computer vision model, which is a, a variation of the Res, ResNext model trained on the ImageNet data set. As you can see, as and when more data is provided to these models and the model complex, complexity increases, we see a continuing trend in terms of accuracy. So the, if you, the, that's the key difference between the two lines. ImageNet has 1.28 million samples. It's a limited data set. And as you can see there, the benefit from model complexity is minimal. But when we try this with Instagram data set, which has billions of samples, we continue to extract benefit or improve accuracy with increased model. This has been the key driving 
characteristic of deep learning models across the board, right? Across different applications such as computer vision, NMT, and ranking, which has led to this ongoing trend of increasing model complexity, increasing training data, since both of these together, they have a compound effect in terms of training throughput, but they continue to provide benefit in terms of final accuracy. So this trend continues to grow and we are seeing this across, I mean, although they're here as an example of computer vision, but we're seeing a similar trend across almost all the applications or services using such models at Facebook. But what does this growth in models or complexity actually translate into in terms of infrastructure? Given when we look at ML models at this scale, and they touch all parts of an infrastructure, whether it being hardware or software. One, the data needs to be large amounts of data, which actually are used for training needs to be stored and provided in a streaming fashion to ensure that it doesn't become a bottleneck, allowing for extracting key features and then providing this as a bet in the format that can be used to train models. Once these models are trained, they need to be evaluated with realistic data. These are not benchmarks anymore, and then deployed to actually provide benefit. And if you look at this, all of these different components here have varying characteristics. And when we think about infrastructure, we need to make sure that we build them out to support such growth and support such varying characteristic. And PyTorch, from the software's point of view, this is, uh, is being used at all of these different stages and is actively being expanded or features are being added to ensure that the entire pipeline starting from data till deployment is supported for the wide variety of models. Looking at the models themselves, just to try to characterize and hear why we are looking at recommendation systems. If you look at the overall split, this is from a paper that we have few of our colleagues from our team have put out on archive just recently. This tries to characterize the use or the overall split between different types of ML or deep learning or AI models at Facebook. If you look at the split, you can see that there is a 50-50 split between recommendation models and rest of the others. With recommendation models contributing to a large chunk, 50, which is around 50% of the overall usage, and all of the remaining models, including CV, NMT, and others, contributing to the rest of the 15. This clearly indicates that this forms an important class of models that we would like to study. And PyTorch, as a framework of choice, would need to support a co catering to all of the varying requirements of such models. Why are these models different, right? So when we look at Let's try to step back and try to understand the key requirements that recommendation models or recommender systems poses for such system, uh, for software, hardware in general. One, to begin with, the models themselves for recommendation systems are much larger. They go into hundreds of gigabytes, whereas typical CV and NLP or NMT models are in order of few gigabytes. Given the key information for these models are stored in large embedding tables or sparse features. This essentially reduces the overall arithmetic intensity or compute complexity in these models. So compared to a, a deep neural a convolution network, which has a lot of dense compute, if you look at a typical recommender system, the amount of compute is an order or several orders of magnitude lower, but the model itself is much larger. Additionally, a key difference is that these models look at much larger amounts of data. A typical recommendation model can read up to petabytes of data, trying to look at a variety of them, trying to extract information to be able to be used for their use cases. So now going into the specifics, let's look at the deep learning recommendation model or DLRM, which we're gonna talk about in, uh, in detail in the uh, in the subsequent sections, and which is the case study for showing the use of PyTorch for recommendation system or this important class of workloads. So typically, a, a DL, DLRMs have four primary components. One, the primary, the first one being embeddings, which are a way to deal with categorical data. 
for the nature of the application itself, deep learning recommendation systems deal with wide variety of data coming from different sources. And these are predominantly categorical as opposed to more structured data used in image or natural language processing. This provides, the, this necessitates having embeddings or the sparse features, which essentially provides a way to store the information from such categorical data. In addition to categorical data, the, the DLRMs also comprehend continuous features, which are more uh, are real numbers, which help categorize the data that is being looked into or characterize them. So there is a requirement to look at both categorical and continuous data, which essentially translates into the, the first feature being embeddings, and the second having MLPs to look at the continuous features. Additionally, both of this are brought down into a common dense representation, which allows them to be combined, interacted, and then treated in a combined way, which can then be used by the top MLP or the neural network here, which tries to infer on this combined data to extract information or provide a, a suggestion or a, in, in recommendation, it could be a pro probability or in ranking, it could be a rank in the way uh, the samples are ordered. Again, the key difference between these models, the models themselves are very large, going into hundreds of gigabytes. The compute primarily comes from the bottom and the top MLPs or neural networks here, which are essentially dense matrix multiplies. And then there is data about dense and sparse features which are streamed in. Owing to the size of the models themselves, as I mentioned, the models are several hundreds of gigabytes. When we look at training such DLRMs, we inherently require them to be distributed. The model does not fit on a single node, whether it be a GPU or a, a box of eight GPUs or CPUs, it needs to be distributed across multiple such nodes to be able to accommodate such models. While this is a requirement from the embeddings of the sparse features, the compute intensive parts, which are the neural network or the top and bottom MLPs have not a lot, but still sufficient amount of compute that needs to be processed as we train through these DLRMs. Hence, given that the smaller uh, parameter size, these are, these are more like the typical CV and MT uh, workloads where these are replicated and these are trained in a data parallel fashion. And given that they, these are interacted together, we have this requirement for this to be model parallel on the embedding so that we can accommodate these large models. And then you have the data parallel MLPs, which are essentially an efficient way to process all the available, the necessary compute. So needing to go from a model parallel phase to a data parallel phase. This provides unique challenges in terms of the algorithm framework and also the hardware infrastructure. Looking at the algorithm itself, typically most deep learning workloads when you do distributed training are trained in data parallel. A sample of batches is split between the multiple nodes and each node has replicated parameters which compute the gradients for that sample. And then there is a reduction or an all reduce to synchronize these updates and then proceed. The assumption here is we are doing a fully synchronous update. But when we introduce model parallelism, this in requirement, this essentially means portions of the model are spliced between the different nodes. And at, at, at any given iteration, only a por portion of the model and the activations from that are available. So as we proceed with the iteration, there needs to be an all to all communication where all the part nodes or the distributed nodes participating in training, exchange this information, reconcile this, partition them in a data parallel way, and then proceed for the MLPs. So if you look at the um, complicated figure on the slide, this essentially showcases the communication requirement, which essentially is an all to all or a personalized all to all. We talk about it in detail in our, uh, on the website, on the blog, and also on the associated paper. Now supporting such algorithm also pro introduces requirements in terms of the software framework. Today, if you look at most of the conventional frameworks, given that data parallelism or data parallel distributed training is the most 
a popular way of doing training support distributed training in with data uh, with all kinds of optimizations for data parallelism but given this need for model parallelism and more so combining model and data parallelism meets puts in a requirement that the framework or the software set uh, setup needs to be able to support a flexible way to be able to express distribution and not only express them have an underlying communication backend which goes in which allows for efficient and optimal communication patterns for not only all reduce but all to all or any other combination of these communication requirements in the following sections we'll talk about how pytorch provides this and we have a reference implementation which implements the dlrms that i talked about and also the training of these dlrms with the all the complexity that i went into detail in the previous slide with distributed execution in as an example in pytorch this is available on github this is what we refer to as pytorch dlrm you can find it at the github link here and if you go to the link if you look at the code itself the code although it represents such a complex application capturing or articulating this complex fairly elaborate training algorithm it's few hundred lines of code as part of the core application if over time with additions and new extensions it's it become up to a thousand or more, around thousand lines of code but if you look at the core application itself it's fairly simple intuitive and it's written up in clear modular form which can tie back to the intuitive example or explanation that i had which breaks down dlrms into these four key components the uh, mlps embeddings interaction and between the mlps the two instantiation being the bottom and the top and given this there is a with dlrms there is a inherent dependency between the data set being used and the model all of which can be very simply or very uh, with, with can very easily be expressed or configured which with command line arguments to be able to run a wide variety of configurations models and data sets as an example to prove the functionality we act, we have this uh, implemented and we have reference results for the publicly available critio display advertising challenge data set both the smaller kaggle version and the larger terabyte version which is available with few hundred million samples and if you look at the uh, a graph or a start thing that that's uh, that's very clear that this also has a very clear common trend seen with other deep learning models where we actually see the uh, loss and accuracy here are some stats about the dlrm github repository itself it's it's grown in popularity it, there are a lot of users active users on it and it supports a wide variety of features both distributed and a uh, single uh, uh, single node execution on cpus gpus and we are actively adding additional components going further my colleague maxim will talk about how things are being built on dlrm and improvements therein thank you dibat sir <laughs> um, so one of the reasons dlrm is popular is because there are many different Uh, algorithmic experiments software optimizations and system research that can be performed with it so if you look at it from a theory and algorithms perspective we can focus on compressing our model so that it takes less time during inference so we can develop a variety of compression techniques that are beyond quantization we can look at different training algorithms um, look at their combinations how they can be done in distributed fashion how they affect embeddings and mlps we can look at system research design new memory systems uh, consider uh, alternative storage uh, such as non volatile memory memory storage we can look at distributed runtimes that perform automatic parallelizations and facilitate the type of distributions that divats had discussed in earlier slides and of course we can look at software optimizations which makes this models and underlying operators run faster on cluster architectures on gpus and other different accelerators and we are going to show uh, some of this um, algorithms in the next slide and first we will discuss 
the theory behind compression of the models. We will focus on compression of embeddings because embeddings take most of the model parameters. And we'll discuss a few techniques that can be done beyond quantization to reduce these parameters. For example, one of the first techniques we have developed is called compositional embedding. In this technique, uh, we take the embedding table shown on the left uh, with a blue square, which contains m vectors, or, and each vector has a d elements in it. So the embedding happens into rd. And we try to attack the compression from the point of view of the number of vectors in the table. And one simple trick that we can do is we can divide the index range into a quotient and the remainder parts by simply creating a quotient by dividing integer division with some constant k and a remainder by with a mod function. Then we can use, it, use this indexes to index into separate embeddings, combine the, the results with an operator, such as sum or MLP, and produce the final vector. Of course, we can design uh, not only choose not only different operators, but we can design different techniques to break the index range. We have shown you one particular technique, but in this conference in KDD, we actually are presenting a paper where we discuss generic techniques that um, break up the index range into complementary parts. You can also see here that this is a very simple technique which um, by breaking the index range and recombining uh, it through different embeddings, it enforces certain structure on this index range. And the, if this is applied recursively, the more and more structure is applied to the embeddings and the, the more and more effect, uh, uh, the more and more it affects statistical performance of the models. But it's a very clean kind of technique which still allows you to very uh, significantly reduce the model size. And I encourage you to attend the talk corresponding to it. Another technique that uh, we have developed, uh, I'm sorry, uh, just to illustrate how easy it is to use this technique, uh, we can see in the slides that we implement a class, uh, quotient remainder embedding bag, uh, which has a forward and an init function, and we only need, in order to use it instead of original embeddings, we only need to add a single flag, uh, a QR flag, and choose a threshold at which it will be applied. If the embedding is too small, it doesn't make sense to split it into two parts, but if it's larger than a certain amount, it will be split automatically for you. Another technique that we have developed is called mixed dimension embedding technique. This technique attacks a different uh, compression from a different angle. Rather than reducing the number of vectors, it tries to either reduce the dimension of the vector or keep the budget for the number of parameters and embeddings the same, but distribute it differently. The core idea is that some of the embeddings are more popular or more frequent than others, uh, which is very common in many different data sets because, for example, some of the movies are more popular than others. And we, given that they show up in the training data set a lot, we should assign more parameters to them, learn them really well, and the movies that we see very rarely are perhaps less important and we can represent them with less parameters, much smaller number of parameters per vector, and then use a joint projection to scale this small dimension to a larger dimension so that we are able to interact the vectors in the same way afterwards. This is a technique that we have published on archive as well and is also available uh, within DLRM. It implements another class uh, that splits the embeddings in this particular way that I have just described. And again, relies on an, one single extra flag to be enabled and a threshold parameter to specify at which sizes it applies. It will have a few extra parameters that you can play with, which um, tell you how to break uh, a particular embedding into different blocks, what are you trying to target, but all of this can have default values, and if you don't want to play with them, you can leave them as they are. 
Finally, I wanted to bring up other techniques that were developed by other people as recently as 2020 and as far away as 2011 that also can be used for uh, refactoring and embedding. For example, if you look at training with multi-layer embeddings, uh, we can try to represent our embedding uh, with a larger dimension k and apply to it uh, essentially a projection or another embedding, another linear layer that brings it back to d. The advantage of that is that when we train the model, we have more parameters to find out the correct um, uh, fit of the model to the data. And this having this larger amount of parameter may potentially uh, impact generalization in a positive way. At the same time, during inference time, we collapse the two embeddings together and save space during the inference. The, another paper the, from 2011 discusses tensor decompositions, which can also be used to express embeddings or elements of embeddings as a product of tensors with different dimensions and is also related to these techniques that we talked about. Of course, these techniques can also be uh, applied together, combined together or applied together with quantization and um, it, it, it can, um, right, and it, we encourage you to experiment with them. Um, next, Topic, we will talk about system research and I'll uh, return the speaking to uh, Divatsa who will talk about some of the very interesting projects that he has uh, collaborated with in this area. Thank you, Maxim. Continue, continuing the work or showcasing the benefits or uh, capabilities of uh, PyTorch DLRM or PyTorch for recommendation systems. One of the key areas, in addition to all the interesting work around algorithms and methods, one of the key areas, given that these are very important class of applications, is looking at systems implications and how these can be deployed, how do we increase performance, and how we can enable training larger models faster so that that can be um, very beneficial. One work in this direction is where we try to extend DLRM using um, a, a, a high performance computing distributed backend called Legion, which has been around for a while. This supports our, our efficient and optimal execution on large scale systems, which has been used on a number of different supercomputers at the scale of thousands of nodes for a wide variety of applications, computational chemistry, combustion, and so on. We are now extending this distributed backend to support um, an application or distributed execution of an applic uh, of DLRMs. Why DLRMs? So give, as I mentioned previously, if typically the most common type of distributed execution has been data parallelism, and this does not provide a lot of complexity, and these have been optimized. If you look at more complex distributed execution using model data or a combination of model and data, this warrants the need for having a more generic, efficient, and flexible a distributed runtime or a backend. And this is what is being explored. And this thesis is being tested out with this, uh, uh, with this, uh, with this project. This is a collaboration with uh, Alex Eikens group at Stanford, where one of his key st students, Zihao, worked very closely with us trying to evaluate this in DLRM. So we've re-implemented re DLRM using FlexFlow, which is essentially is a front end for the distributed Legion runtime allows for defining layers or the, uh, the operators needed for the DLRM model and breaks it down into the Legion tasks. Once we have the Legion tasks, then we can leverage Legion's inherent capabilities to distribute and execute the distributed uh, model in an efficient way. So if the code on the right actually depicts how we distribute or how we define a strategy. Here is a simple example of model parallel embeddings and data parallel MLPs, where we can actually define, once we create the MLPs, similar to how we do it in PyTorch, create ML, creating MLPs and the embeddings, these are identified and tagged to all of the nodes participating in the distributed execution. And then Legion is able to take care of it as part of its runtime. 
as you can see, FlexFlow is a front end that's used for these um, defining these ops. And we are actively looking at how FlexFlow and Regen can be actively integrated in PyTorch to provide the expression, uh, the improved expression capabilities or articulation that PyTorch provides so that we can define models and then run them efficiently with this backend. So just to talk about, there are some examples where these have been tried internally on our data center, um, on our clusters. And also folks at Stanford have been running some representative DLRM models at scale on the summit supercomputers and have seen very encouraging results. Again, this framework or this implementation is available uh, in open source in the link here. I, we request all of you to please take a look at it, try it out, encourage you to um, experiment with it and see if it helps. In addition to systems research, there has been another area of where DLRM or PyTorch DLRM is being used is for benchmarking. Again, given that this is a very important class of problem or type of model, which has not been as represented as much in academia or in research as much as the CV and NMT models. A key reason for this is for the lack of a reference implementation and some sort of a benchmark. And PyTorch DLRM tries to bridge this gap by providing this. Once we had this implementation, Maxim has been working over the last year or so trying to get this as a proposal or as a standard benchmark into the MLPerf benchmark suite. MLPerf benchmark suite is quickly becoming a, a, a standard benchmark for deep learning applications across vendors and practitioners with uh, participation from a wide range of companies, including Google, Facebook, Intel, NVIDIA, and so on. Here, with the current uh, recently released version 0.7, our proposal for uh, uh, DLRM has been incorporated. And just to call out the kind of work that went in to make this happen, a, a very detailed study to look at uh, sensitivity of different model parameters, trying to establish target accuracy and metrics so that when this is provided as a benchmark for a wider audience, that when different combinations will still lead to the final results and it becomes a common platform for comparison and the results coming from different platforms or different implementations can be effectively compared. Again, the MLPerf GitHub page is here and you can look at the implementation and all the uh, uh, relevant details along with it. Additionally, there has been recent work with Maxim and his colleagues have been doing, trying to look at pushing in or adding inference version of DLRM also to the MLPerf benchmark. Again, this involves ensuring that the benchmark is defined in a very airtight and a comprehensive way so that when evaluated on the multitude of platforms, it still provides a, a baseline for comparison. And with this, uh, they've got, uh, integrated the DLRM inference benchmark with the MLPerf load gen utility, which generates load at varying characteristics. And the benchmark is serving this so that we can capture the, uh, the benchmark's performance, SLA, latency, and so on. And again, this is available on the uh, inference website. And this is being actively considered uh, as a standard benchmark for MLPerf. What we provided and what the PyTorch DLRM is, is a reference implementation, which has enabled a lot of things where people have built on top of it. Maxim talked about um, the algorithm and methods which have extended onto it. We've talked about system research where we tried to extract it to other distributed runtimes or uh, uh, optimized frameworks. And additionally, there is a standard benchmark. I just wanted to also touch upon a few of the recent works where this has been adapted, embraced by the community and vendors in general or hardware pl platform companies to look at DLRM more seriously, optimizing it for their platform and ensuring that these optimizations are pushed back so that the larger or the wider community can benefit. We're calling out two such examples here. One is from Intel, where they've taken the reference version of PyTorch DLRM not only optimize the PyTorch stack for CPUs, I've also done DLRM specific optimization together with which they've seen an order of magnitude improvement over the reference version. And not only that, given that 
they want to continue to push the training throughput. They've optimized it this for a cluster of CPUs, showcasing significant performance improvement. They have a paper on this with the same title on archive. We encourage all of you to take a look at it. And additionally, they have a very detailed blogs post where they go into detail of the different types of optimization and what they've enabled. Additionally, what they've tried to do, what they've uh, enabled is essentially mixed precision training with BFLOAT. The next generation CPUs support BFLOAT and they've enabled this so that we can, PyTorch GLRM can be used to evaluate the implications or the benefits or limitations of using such a, a reduced precision representation for training recommendation systems. Also, NVIDIA, as part of their MLPerf optimizations, have looked at a DLR, PyTorch DLRM, contributing their optimizations back to PyTorch and providing this as a reference implementation, where they've tried to where they've significantly improved not only single GPU performance and also multi GPU performance. Additionally, given that accelerators are add-on hardware platform used for training, in this case, they've looked at the end-to-end -end pipeline focusing on the data pre-proc, ensuring that that doesn't become a bottleneck. And at the end of the day, making sure that any model or applications running based on DLRM or DLRM-like applications will see the benefit when running on um, uh, NVIDIA GPUs or NVIDIA platform. Again, this is available, more details on the blog site, and they've enabled FP16 training, mixed vision FP16, which allows to leverage or expand extract more performance from the GPUs. We hope all of this gives you an example of the applicability of PyTorch, how it can be used for recommendation systems. And as a case in point with PyTorch DLRM and the multitude of works that have happened around it would give a, a good idea of, of the capability of PyTorch and PyTorch DLRM in general. With this, we'd like to conclude. Thank you for attending this talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I uh, will pause for some more questions uh, before diving into the captain talk. Uh, so I, we've answered uh, many of the questions already on the chat channel, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions uh, live from the team. There's a question from uh, Sangdi uh, Divats. Uh, how does the model handle new index or cold start items? Right. So the way we actually built PyTorch DLRM is that there is already a data set that's available. If there are new indices or the data set itself is extended, uh, we could include these new samples and continue training or train on top of the already trained model with whatever intermediate state. Uh, there is no specific handling for such cold start. It can be included uh, uh, with the additional data coming in. But yeah, we haven't, with the PyTorch DLRM currently, we don't have any uh, additional way to handle uh, cold start items. Maxim, did you want to add any more details or clarify? Yeah, I can clarify. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I think you can always map an index into a particular range using different functions, right? So that's one way of handling uh, new indices. You simply map them into an existing range, for example. And often the indices have a, such a large range that you have to map them into some contained space anyway. That's true. 
Sangdi, does that answer your question? Yep. Thanks. So Abu Bakr, for your questions, uh, do you want to ask anything more uh, live on the compression techniques? So auto encoder is very different technique uh, versus what is used here in the embedding tables. Uh, so should we give people like a five minute break uh, before we start the next uh, video? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so let's give everyone a five minute bio break uh, and uh, we'll start at uh, 2.50. Uh, so let's start at 2.50 p.m. Yeah. While people take a break, I'm just curious, are others able to unmute and kind of ask questions or is there is that kind of locked out? Maybe Jaswant can help us answer this. Yeah, people. I somewhere. don't think it's locked out. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, uh, okay. I guess anyone can unmute. Yeah, okay, looks like people can unmute and talk. And we encourage folks to uh, keep it interactive, ask questions if it comes up. We are trying to answer the questions on the chat window itself. Since we can unmute, if there are any other questions that you, you guys wanna address directly, please feel free to ask, ask us. Yeah, please take advantage of uh, the words and Maxim being uh, available live to answer your questions. Hi, Sumit, just to answer your question while people are still are on break, there are comparison for Credio dataset on the AUC metric as well. Uh, some of these are included in our paper and uh, a more detailed comparison is available on the MLPerf web website where 
Criteo dataset is used as the benchmark dataset, and AUC is the target metric for the benchmark. Right, it can actually take metadata as input. There is no special handling of cold start per se. That was what I was trying to clarify. But a cold start in terms of the additional data or metadata is something that you can pass in and the model itself is built in a way to handle this. Sumit so uh, commented that uh, DLRM seems very similar to NVIDIA Merlin. Uh, so Sumit, so we would we are hoping that we inspired the NVIDIA Merlin team to launch this after they've worked with us on the DLRM side. Yep, and one other difference is um, it's completely PyTorch based. NVIDIA Merlin provides additional components for data input, uh, data reading and everything else. What we try to do with DLRM is to keep it as a standalone PyTorch only application, which makes it easy to extend and, and uh, gives enhanced flexibility. Yeah, so Merlin is a totally separate framework. Uh, so it's not based on PyTorch or TensorFlow. It's a separate framework in itself, and it comes with the NV tabular for the data processing side, and the Merlin for the recommendable systems. Okay, yeah. so let's get started on the next session, which will be uh, Captain Model Interpretability, and uh, Nadeen will be uh, talking about that. Hello everyone and welcome to this talk on model understanding for PyTorch and recommender systems. In the first part of the talk, I'd like to introduce a novel model interpretability library called Captum and show how you can use the library for different types of PyTorch models. 
The second part of the presentation, I'd like to walk you through a case study for recommender systems and show how the algorithms from Captum Library can help us to better understand our recommendation systems and also those, how those learnings can potentially help to improve our models. Lastly, I'll talk about the challenges and the future directions that we are taking for the library. So many of you have probably heard about different definitions of model interpretability. Uh, but for the scope of this presentation, let's define it as the ability to describe AI model internals and their predictions in human understandable terms. You might wonder why is model interpretability important and why do you care about it? It is important because it helps us to understand how our models make decisions. It helps us to understand misclassifications. And lastly, the better we understand our models, the more likely it is that we will improve them. And thereof, more likely it is that we'll push the boundaries of cutting each research. So how can we make a number of well-known interpretability algorithms accessible to all PyTorch model developers and available for most PyTorch models. To do so, we developed a library called Captum. Captum means comprehension in Latin, and the library has three core characteristics. The first one is the multimodality. This means that we can apply uh, the algorithms from Captum library to any type of PyTorch models and also to inputs that are, uh, have different modalities, whether it's text, video, audio, um, image. The extensibility says that we can easily extend the library, add new algorithms and new features, and lastly, the library is easy to use. This means that we can use it with a couple lines of code, and we can also visualize the insights learned about our models um, with a couple lines of code. So what does the Captain library offer? Captain library offers a number of attribution algorithms that allow us to interpret the output predictions with respect to the inputs, the output predictions with respect to all hidden neurons in um, hidden layers and the hidden neurons with respect to the inputs. The following diagram summarizes all algorithms that we have in Captum library available. On the left side of the diagram, we can see the attribution algorithms that allow us to attribute the output prediction or internal hidden neurons to the inputs of the model. The ones on the right side of the diagram allow us to attribute the output prediction to internal hidden layers. The algorithms can be also categorized in two large groups, uh, gradient perturbation-based approaches. So gradient uh, approaches are highlighted in orange, perturbation ones in green, and there are two algorithms that do not uh, belong to any of those groups and they are highlighted in blue. So within these algorithms, you might find some which are simple baselines, such as silency maps, input times, gradients, layer activation, or layer gradient time activations. There are a number of other algorithms that are more popular in uh, computer vision communities, such as guided gradcam, occlusion gradcam, deconvolution or guided backprop. Although these algorithms are very popular in a computer vision community, they, our implementations are generic enough so that they can be applied to any model that meets the requirement for the algorithm. For example, for guided gradcam or gradcam, we uh, would like that the model belongs to a CNN family. There are a number of algorithms that use so-called baseline under ref or reference. Baseline is a um, very uh, well-known and important notion in the world of attributions, and I would like to spend a couple minutes to describe it. So 
what is baseline? So in order to understand what is what characterizes the most certain object, we compare it with another object that lacks those um, characteristics. So baseline is based on th that same concept. So it helps us um, to blame certain parts of our input for our prediction based on of a comparison of our input with another input that lacks those characteristics that are important for our prediction. In case of image, let's say in this particular example, if we um, predict a dog and we attribute to dog, we want to know what is important for uh, predicting a dog. So for that reason, we need another image where there is no dog. And we can take any other random image uh, or we can take this image and ablate the dog by replacing it with a rectangle and compare it with the uh, uh, actual input. But one might think that this will create a baseline input that is out of our data distribution. To solve this problem, we can think of, um, instead of using this white rectangle, use a background. So the same concept applies also to text. We can compare our text with a sequence of uninformative tokens, or we can compare our text with another text where we perturbed or flipped uh, one of the tokens to see how important that token is for our prediction. In a general case, when we have any kind of numerical representations of our input features, um, as a baseline, we can think of um, ablating, removing those features by setting them zero to find out how important they are. However, zero uh, valued features aren't always uninformative. For some tasks, they can be very meaningful and informative, and we have to be very careful uh, when we choose the baseline value. This is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to choose the baseline. So we got to know overall what kind of algorithms we support and some get to know about some of those uh, well-known concepts and notions for attributions. Now let's see how we can use Captum library. So I, as I mentioned before, we have a number of algorithms that allow us to attribute the output predictions to the inputs. So those are the primary attribution algorithms or feature importance algorithms. And in this particular example, we have two targets, two output target zero, target one. We have one hidden layer that has two neurons and we have three input features. To perform attribution, we choose an attribution algorithm. In this case, I chose integrated gradients or I imported from captum.attr package. I create an instance of integrated gradient by passing the forward function of my model and I define my input. In this case, I decided to use a random input. I call attribute on my attribution algorithm by passing the input and the target index of the output that we, I would like to attribute to. So the returned attributions have the same shape as the input. They can be both positive, negative, or zero. Zero means that those inputs do not contribute to the prediction. Positive means that those inputs are positively correlated with the prediction. A negative means that they are negatively correlated with a prediction. So in this particular case, I did not use baseline, although this algorithm does use baseline. And when there is no baseline specified, then all zero baseline is used. But we can choose to define also the baseline and pass it as an argument to our attribute method. The second group of algorithm that I've mentioned was uh, the neuron attribution algorithms. So this algorithm allow us to attribute one of our internal neurons to the inputs. And one of such algorithm is neuron conductance. And I decided to use it in this example. To use it, we imported from Captum ATTR uh, package. 
neuron conductance is similar to integrated gradients. It uh, applies chain rule with respect to the hidden neuron. So we create an instance of neuron conductance, pass our model and um, hidden layer, in this case, linear layer. Then we define our input and we call attribute on attribution algorithm by passing our input and the neuron index that we would like to use for our attribution. The returned attribution, again, have the same shape as the inputs. Similar to previous case, they can be positive, negative. The magnitude of attribution score signifies the strength of the important signal for those features for that particular neuron. The third group of attribution algorithm is a layer attribution. So this allows us to attribute one of the output target to intermediate layer. In this case, we um, attribute target zero to our hidden linear layer. We chose here a layer conductance algorithm. Layer conductance is similar to neuron conductance that um, instead of uh, attributing to using one hidden neuron for attribution, it uses all hidden neurons for the attribution. And it allows us to attribute an output prediction to all neurons in the hidden layer. So in this case, we also uh, call attribute by passing by inputs and the target index. The returned attribution have the same shape as the output of the hidden linear layer. So in a general case, we can use all attribution algorithms from Captum package by using the same signature, creating an instance of attribution algorithm, passing forward function, calling attribute by passing inputs and any other necessary arguments for that algorithm, that this allows us to uh, compare attribution algorithms with each other and also switch from one approach to another. It's also important to mention that we scale these algorithms that we support data parallels and distributed data parallels. They help us to um, distribute the forward and backward passes on different GPUs. And we have the support um, also for neuron and layer attribution methods. Some of the attribution algorithms internally expand the inputs and this may lead to out of memory situations if we don't handle that correctly. So we uh, internally slice those expanded inputs into smaller pieces and perform the forward and backward passes on those pieces and ultimately aggregate the results. This helps us to avoid out of memory situations. In terms of perturbation algorithms, if we have enough memory available, we might prefer to perturb multiple features together. This will help us to improve the runtime performance of our algorithm. So I showed all um, different kinds of algorithm that we have in Captum library and how you can use it for small toy examples, but how we can actually use it for a real examples and how we can visualize attributions for complex models. So let's start with a computer vision example. Um, so I have here a ResNet, pre-trained ResNet 152 model, and uh, we use uh, occlusion algorithm that is a perturbation algorithm to attribute to the dog prediction. And we can see on the right side that the input patches, pixel patches that correspond to the dog head turn green. So green meaning that there are importance in predicting the dog. Whereas the ones on the cat or some parts of a background turn red, meaning that they are negatively correlated with the dog class and the white means that those pixels do not contribute to prediction at all. So if we attribute to the cat, then we can see that the pixels on the dog turn red because they are contributing to a dog class and then pulling 
that are pulling away from the cat and the pixels on the cat head and body turn uh, green. So another example of uh, feature uh, ablation, here we uh, use a ResNet 18 model and fog segmentation. So the segmentation will help us to segment our inputs into different groups, into segments that we will ablate together. In this case, we have three segments, bottles, monitor, and the background. And um, we perform feature ablation in this example and attribute to the monitor class. To, when we do so, we see that the pixels that are on the bottles are red. That means that they contribute to a different class and they pull away from the monitor class. The pixels on the monitor itself, because we attribute to monitor are green, means those are the important pixels for predicting monitor. And uh, Pixels and the boundaries of a monitor are red. So these are the boundary uh, pixels that are separating our background from monitor. And there is a certain level of uncertainty. And um, therefore, we also have more red pixels. So I showed you a couple visualizations, but there were um, more static visualizations. So we decided to create a tool called Captum Insights that will help us to make those visualizations more interactive. And uh, this tool allows us to debug and understand model predictions and supports different types of PyTorch models and input features. Here is a screenshot of Captum Insights tool that was used to visualize the attributions for different images that were used in combination with a ResNet 15 model. Here we can see that uh, by using computer vision renderers, we can uh, visualize which pixels are more important in our prediction. We can do the similar experiment also for text. In this example, we trained a text classifier using IMB, IMDB dataset and we can see which tokens are more important for uh, predicting a positive sentiment and which tokens are negatively correlated with a positive sentiment. So the, magnet, uh, the intensity of the color signifies the strength of the important signal for our prediction. So we can do similar experiment also for other models that are neither text nor image. And we created a three layer MLP model using Titanic dataset. And here uh, we visualize the important scores for predictions uh, for survival and a non-survival binary classification use case. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, multimodality is one of the main features of Captum library. And one of the well-known multimodal uh, models is visual question answering. Um, in this case, we can see uh, which modality is more important for our prediction, text or image. And we can also dig uh, deeper into a specific modality to understand which part of that modality is more important for our prediction. All right, so that was the first part of the presentation where I presented the Captum uh, library and show how we, we can use it. In this section of the presentation, I would like to walk you through a case study for deep learning recommender models, also known as DLRM models. So um, I will start from uh, representing the architecture of a DRM model and the data set that we use for our experiments. Then I'll show how to compute feature importances for both for sparse and dense features, then how we compute the importances in the interaction layer, um, move, moving to neuron importance and computing neuron importance for the last fully connected layer. I'll also show how neuron importance 
based pruning can help uh, to improve the performance of uh, our DLRM model. So the data set used for our experiment was the crit Criteos traffic over a period of seven days. For uh, training, we used 39 million samples and for testing 3.2 mil million. The data set is highly unbalanced. We have only 27% clicks. And uh, the data set also represented through 26 sparse and 13 dense features. You might have already seen the DLRM architecture, but I would like to walk you through the architecture and the components that we would like to examine and put under the microscope during our uh, case study. So we have 13 dense features and 26 sparse features. And in order to avoid um, high dimensional representation of sparse features with one hot encodings, we um, represent them through embedding vectors using embedding tables. So this will help us to, to get um, embedding vect vector per sparse feature leading to 26 embedding vectors, each having 16 dimensions. So these embedding vectors will be concatenated together with the transformed dense feature that was, uh, was uh, transformed in a way that is represented as one feature that has 16 dimensions. And in, a, as a, in the output of a concatenation, concatenated la layer, we'll have 27 features, each 16 dimensions. So these, these features, uh, will, we will then perform interaction for those features. So each feature, pairwise interactions using dot products. So when we perform that interaction, that will um, help us to get 27 times 13 interactions. And we will also concatenate this with um, 16 dimensions of a dense feature leading to 367 features or variables in the output of an interaction layer. This is then passed through an MLP module uh, that performs linear ReLU transformation. And lastly, in the last layer, uh, we pass it through a sigmoid transformation that will produce a score between zero and one, indicating whether the ad was clicked or not. So as first, we would like to understand the feature importances and we would attribute our output prediction click or non-click to our uh, dense features and to our embedding vectors. For this experiment, we use integrated gradient algorithm. So in this diagram, we can see the feature importances for five samples, five ads, that were predicted as clicks with a prediction score larger than 0 0.99. On the x-axis, we see the input features. The first 13 features are the dense features followed by 26 sparse features. Y-axis represents the attribution score. For each sample, we use a different color and uh, stacked those uh, contribution score for each sample uh, on top of each other. We can see that dense features contribute both um, to clicks um, and non-clicks, whereas the sparse features only have primarily positive contribution. So positive contribution means that those, um, that, uh, those features are positively correlated with clicks, click, and the negative means that those features are correlated with non-clicks. So we can zoom into the sparse feature space and um, also look the attribution score distributions uh, for all dimensionalities. Um, 
So we can see that majority of sparse features have similar uh, distribution of attribution scores, uh, except that there are some outliers. In this experiment, we use um, 85 ads that were predicted as clicked with a prediction score larger than 0 0.999. So this diagram summarizes the important score for um, 85 samples that were predicted as ads with a high prediction score. And the important part of this um, is that we can see again how important are the sparse features are in predicting ads. Uh, at clicks and uh, and how um, how different um, are the contributions uh, of a dense feature? So dense features contribute both to click and non-click. So this experiment was for 85 samples that were predicted with high high prediction score as clicked. So now the question is, what will happen if we take random 85 samples. So in the next experiment, we took random 85 samples and only 13% of those uh, 85 samples were predicted as clicked. And we see how the distribution of important scores is changes, how the dense features become more prominent and how sparse features, the contribution of sparse features become smaller and smaller. This confirms how important is the, uh, how important are the dense features for predicting non-click, non-clicks, because this particular sample set has majority non-clicks. So now let's increase our uh, sample size from 85 to 135K and see how the pattern changes. So we see similar pattern, again, for even for larger sample sizes, we still see that the dense features are contributing significantly to non-clicks. So since we know that um, DLRM model starts overfitting after the first epoch. So we decided to see how the feature importance score changes over the epochs. So um, for the same batch. So we see that the dense features haven't, don't change much. So their distributions is relatively remains the same, but we see that the sparse features, uh, the contributions and the patterns in the sparse features changes drastically from epoch to epoch. One might think that this uh, can be also associated with uh, or related to the fact of overfitting. This, of course, requires a much more thorough investigation and analysis. In the second part of our experiment, we attribute the output prediction, click or non-click, to the output of our interaction layer that contains 367 features. And um, in this experiment, we also used um, like layer conductance algorithm. So in, those, in this diagram, we see feature importances for 86 samples with prediction score larger than 0 0.9. As I explained before, the first 13 features are the dense features, and we again see how dense features contribute both to clicks and non-clicks. And um, from interaction variables, we can see that all interaction variables are primarily either contributing to clicks or have no contribution to the final prediction, which suggests that um, feature interactions either magnify the importance of uh, those features and support uh, the click predictions or they do not contribute to prediction at all. In the third part of our experiment, we uh, perform neuron uh, attribution and we take the last 256 neurons in the last MLP layer and we attribute them to input features. Those are the dense features and the um, sparse embeddings. In this experiment, we used neuron conductance algorithm. 
So in this diagram, we can see the neuron importance scores aggregated across 100 samples that were predicted as clicks with um, prediction score larger than 0 0.9. X-axis represents our 256 neurons in the last fully connected layer. Y-axis is the attribution scores. If we zoom into this diagram, we can see that for each sample, we stacked the attribution scores um, for each neuron, where the size of um, each rectangle corresponds to the magnitude of a contribution of that specific neuron for the prediction. So when we were conducting this experiment and analyzing the data, we noticed that out of these 256 neuron, 15% has only consistently negatively um, contributed to click prediction. That means that all that 15% neurons were consistently across all 100 samples were contributing to non-clicks. Another 15% did not con consistently across all samples did, did not contribute to prediction at all. And another 70% has either a mixed contribution or only positive contribution. So one might think that what will happen if we actually prune that 15% of um, those neurons? We might think that this might lead to increase of false positives because those are the neurons actually that contribute to non-clicks. But our true positives and false, uh, true positive might increase and false negatives might decrease. So this is a hypothesis that we want to test and in our next um, example we basically prune that 15 percent neurons using neuron importance um, algorithm and also in addition to that we prune 15 percent randomly and also 15 percent based on the magnitude to see how do those other different pruning techniques perform compared to neuron importance pruning. Our ex experiments show that when we prune that 15% neurons, our true positive score increases by 7.1%, and that is 24, approximately 24,000 uh, acts. In contrary to that, random pruning leads to the reduction of um, true positives, leading to a um, reduction of a uh, 4.8% and magnitude leads to a reduction of our true positives by minus 14.8%. So we look deeper into this in order to understand how other performance measures change. We see that for, um, for the pruning that was performed with neuron importance, our F1 score increased by 1% and recalled by 3%. So this is associated with the fact that our true positive increased and our false negatives decreased. Yet the precision decreased by 2%. This is associated with the fact that our false positive increased a tiny bit. But um, that in increase was, um, that increase of false positive was, wasn't as significant as our um, decrease in the false negatives and increase in true positives. In contrary to neuron importance-based pruning, magnitude and random uh, pruning lead to increase of our precision score, meaning that they, our false positives actually reduces. And uh, for weight magnitude-based pruning leads to 3% improvement of our precision score. So this uh, leads someone to think that these different types of pruning um, techniques can help us actually to um, improve one or the other metric that is more necessary for our task. To summarize, sparse features primarily contribute, we found out that sparse features primarily contribute to clicks predictions 
and thus that sparse feature importance patterns significantly fluctuate across epochs, that feature interactions result to features that primarily contribute to clicks or have no effect on the prediction. Neuron importance-based pruning can help us to increase our true positives, the harmonic mean and the recall scores and reduce false negatives. And that magnitude-based pruning can help us to reduce false positive scores and increase precision. As we saw, attributions can be very useful to understand our models and even improve them. However, they come also with some limitations. Attributions do not capture feature correlations or interactions. Finding good baselines is challenging and evaluating those different types of attribution algorithms and comparing them with each other is even harder. Attribution-based techniques also do not explain the model globally. So if we want a global view, then we need to aggregate um, sample-based results. We are currently expanding Captum beyond feature attribution by adding Captum.robust package that allows us to construct adversarial attacks against those models and study the connection between model robustness and interpretability. We also add a Captum.metrics package that uh, contains sensitivity and infidelity metrics uh, that also allows us to measure the robustness of our attribution algorithms. Captum.concept that allows us to explain our models globally uh, using different uh, concepts. And Captum.optim that uh, will start from uh, optimization-based visualizations. So this is all for this presentation. Thank you for listening to us and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. So thank you everyone. Uh, looks like there are a number of questions uh, related to uh, Captain. Uh, Marine, are you on? Um. Okay. Yes. yes, I am. So any insights why sparse features contribute mostly positive? Um, why sparse features contribute mostly positive? Um, that's a good question. So as so we use this uh, Kegel data set and uh, the, all features are anonymized. So I wasn't able to uh, like exactly dig deeper into a specific feature to understand which feature for which sample. So because there's those anonymized um, cases, um, samples. So, but um, we believe because the sparse features are very specific um, for, for an example, like they, they very targeted, very specific um, describing an example. Um, so that's why they are, they are more important. Um, but um, in terms of like specific what features are those, I, I don't exactly know because it's like anonymized data set. Um, so next question from Sumit. Uh, is it true that one can switch off MLP related components and just use FM-based components uh, in case uh, if one just wants to use the linear model. Switch off MLP-related and uh, just use FM-based. Um, FM, what, what, how do you exactly do you abbreviate that? Sumit, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Move on to the next question. Uh, uh, so, Narin, do you think we will be able to share code of uh, Captum and DLRM experiments uh, sometime in future? Yeah, I 
we can um, decide where we want to share it, whether in the Captum side or whether we want to sh share it in a TLRM um, project somewhere, but I would be happy to share. Um, but I think we need to logistically um, decide, yeah, where yes. we no, no, yeah. share so it. Yeah, people are asking for a collab or a Git repo. I think it will be good to add a tutorial similar to what we have for BERT. Okay. Mm -hmm. So people are also asking, uh, are we planning to publish a paper on this? Uh, well, I, ha I haven't planned it, but if someone wants to collaborate, I don't <laughs> publish a paper, I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, so, so far no plans, but I don't mind. And uh, what is the insight behind selective pruning and uh, why did it work so far? What is the insight behind selective pruning? Why did it work so well? Um, well, it worked. Um, I think it, it's very, because I think the, um, we are pruning the neurons, right? And we know which neurons are important for predicting clicked. And this is a binary classification. Um, I think it's very obvious to me too. Um, if I actually, see that some neurons are predicting to non-clicked. Um, if I <clears throat> prune them or if some, then I will actually <clears throat> reduce that signal for non-clicked. And um, my, my true positives increase, but at the same time, it worked well to increase true positive, but at the same time, actually my, um, um, I think uh, at the same time, some of the metrics, right, the recall um, actually dropped. So um, it's actually helped to increase the true positives. Um, but um, at, a t at the same time, we, um, uh, we I think, uh, I have to look, I think the false positives at the same time increases. Um, and that is, that, that is the drawback. So, I mean, it increases because I, I just re removed the signal for non-clicks. Okay. So I think it's obvious and it's just a, like, a, it, it's just a binary classification case. Okay, so I'd like to say that, add that um, this is still a very active area of research and I would uh, encourage the researchers uh, listening to the talk to participate and join and you know take the work forward. Uh, we will publish the code on uh, GitHub and make the collab uh, notebooks available. So in the interest of time, uh, I would now switch over to the last talk. Uh, yeah, I think there was another question, Gita. I think that was on why we chose like 256 neurons. I think because those are the all neurons in the last fully connected layer. So that's the architecture um, had only 256 neurons in the last layer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let me share my screen again. Hello, everyone. Welcome to PyTorch Career Tutorial Sessions. So this is fourth session in the tutorial list, and we will talk about how to use MMF for knowledge-based recommender systems. So this is a joint presentation between me, Amanpreet, and Vedanuj Goswami, and we are both uh, AI research engineers at Facebook AI Research. So today's agenda will cover uh, three things. We will talk about MMF, give an overview of it, and then we'll create an uh, OKVK data set inside MMF and show how exactly you can implement your own. And then we will show an implementation of a new novel model MMF transformer from scratch, and which will give you an idea of how to implement your custom models inside MMF. So the code for this uh, tutorial is available at the collab. There's a QR code which you can scan to follow along with us. So let's start with what exactly is MMF. 
So MMF is uh, an OSS multimodal framework, which is a research framework for vision and language uh, research. And you can do any kind of uh, research on any of the vision and language tasks that MMF supports. We have 20 plus of those. And we also have the state of the art implementation for multiple of these um, models that work best on these uh, uh, tasks. So this framework also has a lot of training utilities that can help you to avoid all of the costs that happens and uh, for every time you start a project from scratch. So IMF has a vibrant community on uh, GitHub and we welcome you to uh, contribute or have a look at IMF on GitHub. So let's talk about what do we mean by a vision and language task here in the context of MMF. So a simple definition will involve like any task that involves a visual and textual uh, component and then requires a reasoning of a board to solve it. So these tasks, and they can't be solved by just by vision alone or just by task or text alone. You need both of them to answer them. So let's uh, ground this into a framework which we'll be using throughout this tutorial. You have an image and a text, you pass them through a model and then you get an output back. This is a scenario we will be working on. This The model is a black box, which we will implement. And the how do we get this image and text that also we will implement in MMF. So let's take an example of a particular kind of vision and language task that we just talked about. So that's visual question answering, one of the most popular one. So what does this task involve? So an image is given and a question is also given based on that image. So understanding you have to like understand the image and then answer the question based on things uh, in the image for example if the image is given alone it doesn't make sense without the question like what exactly you need to answer and then if the question is alone it, the con there is no context on what to answer then text week is a special special case of uh, vq where you need to read text in the image to answer a question and the data set that we'll be implementing, okay, VK outside knowledge, VK is also a special case of VK where you need outside knowledge, some knowledge source or some outside knowledge to answer the question that is present here. We will see examples of okay, VK later. So here you can see like on the board, there is written like left lane closed. If you read that, then it should be easy to answer from the model like that the answer is left. This is the way these models work on VK. They're taking an image and a text and just classify them into like a number of answer options that are there. MF contains a lot of these uh, data set which can broadly be classified into five categories. Visual question answering, we have like multiple of variations of visual question answering, visual genome clever, then image capturing where you have to generate a caption for the image. Reasoning, these are pure reasoning tasks which require reading both image as well as the text to answer something about this particular scenario then dialogue, which involves a dialogue over the image and integrity classification, something like classifying a meme into hateful or not hateful. So MMF is a multimodal framework built for fast v and research, and we have successfully used it into multiple projects in the past. So what makes MMF so special and why should you care about it? All components in MMF are PyTorch powered, which, makes, which means that all of the knowledge that you have about PyTorch, you can use it here as well. MF basically involves less boilerplate. We do, do give you all of the utilities out of the box, like distributed training, checkpointing, early stopping, and everything else. A lot of metrics implementation outside of the box. It's powered by PyTorch, and it's modular and composable. You can take only the components that you care about. You don't need other components. You don't need to use them for MF. You can use MF as a library. For example, you only care about the model and you want to test it on your task and don't want to use MF, that's easy to do. So let's dive in a little bit into our collab tutorial, understand how we are going to implement this data set. Um, so how do the data set work inside MMF? Let's take an example of the visual question answering task. You have an image and text, you pass them to a processor. So processor is a concept inside MMF which takes in something and just outputs something that, that has like a, a vari variation of the input text. The processors can be used for like various kind of things. Uh, it's basically a reusable block inside MMF that many data sets can use. For example, there can be a glove processor which converts uh, the words into indices for the glove vocabulary 
and or it can directly give you glove vectors as well same for bot it converts it uh, the processor can convert the given text inside into uh, into the indices of the bot vocabulary and then you can map them to the bot bot embeddings then the examples goes on and exa some examples of from other frameworks are like torch vision transforms which is same visual set of um, processors that can be used anywhere so you go and the data goes through a bunch of processors to come into the format that mmf models can accept you pass them into a sample and then a list of sample basically creates a sample list which is sent to the model so let's start implementing this data set inside the plan so in this tutorial we will show like how we can use mmf to build a knowledge based recommender system so let's start with setting up the OKVK okay, data set. So before we dive into details of OKVK okay, data set, let's set up some prerequisites for MMF. So we have enabled auto reload here so that every time you uh, add a new module, you will, uh, if you don't need to like read on the runtime, it will automatically re-import something at the, all of the modules and it will give you the fresh copy. So we can start from like uh, Git cloning the MMF and you basically will clone it inside the content directory. So it gives me an error because I'm a holiday exist. I will run this collab notebook once, but in your case, it will uh, basically clone it from scratch. Then we install some specific versions of Torch and Torch Vision that MMF requires and because collab has some different ones. And then we basically uh, set up the MMF in develop mode so we can edit it. And we also upgrade some dependencies which are very old inside collab, uh, just for the sake of it because these are already installed, it will just say requirements are already satisfied and then we can move to the next thing. So you can see like uh, a specific version of MF has been installed from source that is up to these candidate 11. So before we move into data set, uh, I want to like talk about the three components that are needed to implement a data set. So first is an annotation database which will basically load the annotations that are provided by data sets. So each data set has its own kind of annotation files. So you need a like, kind of like a wrapper, which will convert it into that MMF format. And so that is easily consumable by MMF in any form. Then you also need an image database, which, which is already provided by MMF, and but can be overridden if something is needed for the specific use cases. So uh, another thing that I want to note is like, our, uh, Example annotation database is already provided in NMF, which can import a various kind of uh, existing uh, file schemas like JSON, JSONL, and but there is sometimes there is a customization need that is needed, so that you will need to implement custom annotation DB in this case, which is the case for annotation DB. Then you finally need to implement a builder class, which will be registered to MMF using MMF registry, which returns back an instance of uh, Torch or Utils or data or data set, and MMF will use it to load the data, which will be passed to the model. So let's first check like how does uh, the OKVK data set actually look like. Let's just go to the OKVK website and have a look there. So you can see this data set is outside knowledge visual question answering and there are some examples which require using knowledge that's not available in the image to answer these. So it has 14,000 questions and it comes in like two forms. One is annotations and one is questions. So questions contain only the questions and annotation contains everything else that is required and the course uses images from Coco. So it, we can like see an example of how that it is looks like inside our collab. So let's run this like W get the annotations, extract them, and also the questions and then extract them. And here we will just print out the annotation keys and the image ID. So here you have like a uh, question like what sport you can you use this for? And the answers are like racing and then racing and uh, 
so this might be a car in the picture and is asking like which sport you can use this for so that's how the uh, the format is basically a question in a separate file and answers in a separate file so the next thing is to like create the annotation db itself so annotation database is already provided by the mmf so you only need to override a particular function for your use case that is load annotation db in this case so because we have two paths one for annotations and one for questions we need to like uh, pass them together as a joint string by a comma so that we can pass them both together so we split the path here into two paths and then we make sure that we have two paths one for question and one for annotation we load them both and if annotation is present in the path zero then the annotations are actually the path zero otherwise the path one is the annotation now what 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 does this uh, load annotation db expects us to do it expects us to like create an array an array a list uh, which basically contains samples of all of the annotations that are present inside the data data set and we need to assign it to the data attribute for this data set so we can we start with creating a list and then we create a question dictionary which points each question id to a question and then we start passing the annotations we take in the question from the question dictionary and then we take in the answers from the annotation itself then we join them together into a single dict so question and answers are in single dictionary now and we append that to the list we have then we assign that to cell dot data and now this dot data set in this get item function where the idx come we can just return cell dot data uh, the idx index of it so you can basically return that as a sample itself so before i move further there is something we will need to talk about so mmf is a configuration first framework so everything inside mmf is based on config why do we do that so the reason of doing that is like we don't want to change code for anything small that we change for example you change a loss function you don't want to go inside the code and change the code to like pick up a new loss function same for the model like different data set should be easily be usable with different data set but just by making the configuration changes so let's see how does mmf configuration uh, system works and what is the hierarchy here so we by default provide a config that is in a slash config slash defaults which contains all of the default parameters something like training snapshot interval what are the maximum updates that are required the batch size then something around checkpoint and distributed now after this like specific stuff comes like something like data set and model configuration which are very specific to the use case you are implementing for example like for data set config of week or two you can have features for train in some lmdb and some as other lmdb and similarly for model config like mmbt can have its own parameter which are different from other models like hidden size how many number of layers drop out so we do provide like default configs for each of the models and each of the data sets that we have but you can override them in the user config which comes in higher priority than the previous one so you can maybe update the trains feature train path to something like your lmdb which is your custom features then you can change the hidden size of mmbt to 1024 if you don't like the default 768 and you also can change something in the default config like training dot batch size so we also provide like command line opts which you can use to override anything that's present inside the configuration from command line that allows us to like faster iterate over the versions and you don't need to actually go inside the configuration and change stuff you can just update from configuration this is also like a very helpful for running sweeps where you can just pass your options multiple times and run sweeps and don't need to really need to change the configuration so let's come back here to the dataset in uh, implementation so now we will actually implement the okay we get a set which will inherit from mmf dataset which expects us to like implement a get item function and mmf dataset is basically a toast or utils dataset which which uh, implements something specific and something required to interact with mmf models so we have some helper methods inside that will help you to automatically download stuff or something else and a lot of other utilities so it also builds annotation db the default annotation db by def uh, on default settings but in this case because we have our own custom annotation db we will override and make sure that the we return okay we can annotation database that we implemented here so we are overriding this and if you override image or feature database you can override those specific things
So we we are making sure that we get the correct annotation path here and just passing it to the OKVK OK annotation database. So then we have a helper function to convert image IDs into the actual image path for Coco, which is basically uh, filling it with zeros till twelve and just uh, make based on train or validation it's returning the correct JPG. For the image trans uh, for the processors, we can just call default processors from init processor from the data set which will init each of the processors present in the inside the configuration. Since we are config first, we also define processors through configuration that allows us to change processors on fly. For example, I can run an ablation on Golov, and then I can run another ablation on uh, BERT, BERT embeddings, or I can run another one on Elmo just by changing the configuration and no code change. But in this specific case, because our image processor needs to be assigned to transform, we are uh, uh, we are like uh, overriding this init processes method. So uh, the transforms, the image DB transforms, expect them to be assigned at runtime. So in the get item method, we just take the sample info from the annotation DB we just created, like we are we talked in past, we passed in the IDX and we just created, and then we initiate a sample instance. Sample is a utility provided from MMF, which which is the which is a format you return need to return the sample from. Uh, you need to run the data from get item. And then you basically pass the text, like the question inside the text processor. And then you just uh, update it into a current sample. So sample is a dictionary. So you can update whatever this processor returned. It also returns a dictionary. We, uh, the signature of processor require that they take in a dictionary and return back a dictionary. So then you also assign the ID and then you get the image path and you and take you basically use the image DB to load the path, load the image, and just assign it to the sample. Then if the answers are present inside the sample info, we use an answer processor to process the answer into a VQA format, making sure everything has like 10, and we have proper scores assigned, and then we assign the targets to the answer scores. This will, this will basically provide score for each of the answers in vocabulary. So. VQA is a classification task where you have like a fixed vocabulary for answers and you basically tell like this, this answer in the vocabulary has the highest, highest uh, probability of being the answer. And targets tell you like what was the actual probability of these things. And uh, most of the models expect targets to be there because that's your output and how the loss will be calculated and loss expected. Then we implement a visualize method which will basically print out the question and uh, visualize the images that are present here. The final step here is to actually register the data set to, uh, to MMF that's done through the data set builder. Uh, so the job of the data set builder is to actually, to actually return the instance of the torch to duties of data set. And because we set the data set class to OKVQA, okay, we can just leave everything else to the MMF data set builder. It will take care of automatically downloading stuff and everything else. The config path is a config we created. That's the config default config for this data set. And now because we already have uh, the config present on GitHub, we will just download it and see how exactly it looks like. And this is how it prints. So you can see like text processor is a vocabulary which uses like glove embedding and everything else. And the annotations are in a proper format and how MF expects them. And then you basically have trained inside okay. So this is a directory structure for MMF that it expects for most of the data set. Like this is the variation and this is the images. So you can read more in the MMF doc uh, documentation on to understand how exactly your data sets um, uh, directories are expected. So you can say like use images is true that will initialize the image DB and if you say features is false, then it won't initialize the feature DB. So MMF can work on features as well as images. So it's model dependent. So then you also specify which which thing to automatically download and then answer processor and image processors like center crop. These are the same as the torch vision transforms. So this is actually a zoo config, which you can add to the separate zoo, which will make sure that uh, it, whenever this command is run, it will automatically download okay, we go. So the zoo config uh, is defined inside the builder class so that it knows where to find the exact URLs to download the exact data. So we have already added all this. We can dump it inside the zoo. And now what we can do is actually visualize one of the examples from this data set. Finally downloaded everything that's required. And you can see 
examples of uh, actual actual okay we created a set like you see who designed the statues for this particular thing this might be some famous statue and there are other things like what is the purpose of the cubes in the picture and you can see them here uh, it's like sitting and what kind of plant is seen in this picture you can see this plant so all of these are like required external knowledge which is not present inside the data set in inside the image itself like what type of event might a couple be preparing for we can run it once more and just see more examples but then afterwards i will hand it to way the knowledge so here are more examples uh it says like what appliance is in the background of this picture so you have to like see what exactly this is and there are other questions like what do you find this kind of animal like this pose you have to tell that so uh, now i will hand it over to vidanush so that he can uh, go over the model part and he can uh, move to the next part now thank you aman <laughs> so i'll share my screen now Okay. Yeah. Hey everyone. Um, I'm Vidanuj. So I'll walk over the um, building the model part. So let's first see how uh, MMF um, data sets connect to the models. So let's take an example, the same example that was shown earlier. We have an image here and, uh, and uh, accompanying a text uh, question. So the <clears throat> and then also maybe other modalities, excuse me. So uh, the image will pass through an image encoder so that we can extract the features. The encoders can be of different types, whether it's a ResNet 152 or ResNext or maybe a faster RCNN, which will give us the um, bounding boxes for different objects in the image. Then for the text, we can have different type of text encoders. Similarly, um, the encoders may be like Bert or Roberta models or even GLUV, fast text, and XLM, XLMR models. And similarly, for if there are other modalities like COCR or any other modalities, we can have a modality encoder for each of these. So once we have the encoder outputs, uh, we do a fusion. So the fusions can be of different types, whether it's an early fusion or late fusion. So we can use different type of fusion encoders for this case. Uh, whether it can be a transformers or like different type of late fusion models, or even we can do like a tension fusion or different other types. So the output of the fusion is fed into a head. So the head can be either a classification head or a pre-training head depending upon the task, or maybe also some other type of heads like, uh, like for image captioning, you will need to have like a generative head. So let's see a, um, some task specific example. So for visual question answering, this is a, a example input. You have an image and an eye accompanied by a question. So we feed this image and question into the model and the model outputs um, some features. And then though on top of those features, we have a classification head, which will classify uh, the question and like classify into the answer space. So for specifically for this question, which lane is closed, um, it answers as left. So let's now dive into our tutorial. So um, we'll, I will start from the uh, modeling part. So where we'll uh, build a model for the OKVK task. So, um, so here will, the task actually Okay, so uh, let's get started with the tutorial. So here we'll build a, a model for the OKVK OK task. The task requires the model to take multiple input modalities. So as we have seen in the data set, it takes, it takes a text question as well as the images. So MMF has built in support for building these type of multimodal, uh, build, building models for these type of multimodal tasks and offers a tons of features to easily build these type of models. So in this specific case, uh, use case, we'll build a transformer-based model for the OKVQA OK task. So uh, first, uh, we need to build the different type of encoders and also a multimodal embedding 
class, which can like take these encoder outputs and build a joint embedding for our different modalities. So for the uh, multimodal, um, so for the modality encoders, um, we have uh, the text modality as well as the image modality. So for the text modality, uh, our data set processors already uh, can pre-process the text and output the tokens using a uh, different type of text encoders, whether it's a BERT based or maybe it's a glove based. So we can uh, specify these different text encoders in our config configuration system, which we'll do it later and we'll, I'll explain it later again. So for the image part, we'll uh, define a new image encoder class, which takes in a uh, multimodal um, encoder base class, which is actually available uh, already provided by MMF. And it builds the encoder, image encoder, based on the parameters we specify in our configs. So the configuration parameters can uh, specify what type of image encoder we want. Like maybe it's a ResNet 50 or a ResNet 152, and maybe other type of parameters, like how many features we want as output, or like the type of pooling and all those. So uh, once we have defined the image encoder, let's next move to the MMF uh, transformer embedding. So this is the embeddings class that we are defining, uh, which will take in the output of these different encoders, and then they will, uh, and then will uh, create some embeddings, which will be later concatenated into a joint embedding for both the different modalities. So then encoding, so the embedding class takes the two modalities, image and text, and it will have three different type of tokens. So these tokens are the input ID tokens. So these are the either the text tokens uh, that are generated by the text encoder or the image features, which are generated by our image, which will be generated by our image encoder. Next is the position ID tokens. So these are the positions of the text tokens or like the image features. So if we have a you know, text sentence, so each of the word in the sentence will be uh, will have a position, like say from beginning, it will be like one, two, three, and so on. And the last type of tokens is the segment ID tokens. So the segment ID tokens specify what type of model it is. So for text, it will say it will have a, a segment ID as say zero, and for image, it will have a segment ID as one. So that just we can differentiate between the modalities. Next, uh, let's move on to the implementation of the MMF transformer embeddings class. So in the initialization method, um, we actually initialize the weights of the text embeddings from the base transformer models embeddings. So this is done just so that we don't have to like retrain the embeddings again and we can use the already trained transformer embeddings. So we'll, we are using these transformer embeddings, uh, we, uh, word embeddings, as well as the position embeddings. And then we uh, initialize like layer norms and dropouts. Similarly for the image embeddings, we define a, a new sequential, um, which takes like uh, two layers. One is a linear layer and then a layer norm. And we also have the image position embeddings and also followed by image layer norm and dropout. For the token type embeddings, or by token type actually we mean the segment embeddings, we all again use the transformer, base transformer models embeddings. So the forward uh, pass of this, or the forward method of this uh, embeddings class it basically takes in the input IDs, the position IDs and segment IDs for both these modalities. So these, um, <clears throat> all the input parameters are defined as a dictionary of string tensor. So the keys will be like which modality it is, uh, which modality is specifying. So for text will be string will be text and the corresponding uh, tensor for the embedding, uh, sorry, corresponding tensor for the input token. And similarly for position IDs and segment IDs. So we pass all these different um, inputs and uh, IDs, or like input and tokens, through our different uh, layers that we have specified here in the init method, and we get the embeddings. So let's first go through the text part. 
So the text embeddings will generate the word embeddings, the position embeddings, and the um, segment type embeddings, which we are seeing here is text type embeddings. And then we'll uh, do an addition and then pass them to the layer norm. And then again, a dropout. So next we go to the, how the image embeddings are generated. Similarly, we'll pass them the, we'll generate first the image input embeddings. And then we'll also have image position embeddings. So we'll have the image token type embeddings. And once we have all of these, what in the end, what we'll do is we will concatenate the embeddings for both the text and the image so that we have a joint embedding. And this will be passed later on, passed to the our transformer model. So let's now move on to the transformer, um, um, transformer based multimodal model, which we'll be implementing. So, so MMF actually comes out of the box with the required boilerplate structure to build these type of models. So MMF has a base transformer class, which comes with some very basic building blocks um, to easily like import transformer models from hugging phase transformers library. And we can modify them according to our use case and build them for like some multimodal tasks. So extending this base class is very easy and we'll just need to implement the methods which are specific to our model. And we can just override them and uh, uh, like customize them according to our need. So these basic uh, building blocks for these type of models are, we need uh, like a transformer base. Second, we need uh, encoders. Third, we need the embeddings. And fourth, we need the different type of heads, whether it's a classification or a pre-training head, or maybe it might be some other generative heads as well. And last, we'll also, we can also specify some losses that we want to apply to the outputs. So let's take an example for like our use case. So here, what we want to do is we want to build a transformer. Let's say we want to, the base to be a BERT base model. So the base transformer class actually comes with the build transformer method, which if you just specify the name of the model in your config, as, such as like here, transformer base as a BERT base uncased, and it will automatically load the model from hugging phase transformers library along with the pre-trained weights. So we don't, uh, we don't need to like uh, change anything there, just specify the name of the model and it will be automatically loaded. And then uh, we define like how the forward pass can be implemented using this base transformer class. Uh, we'll go into more detail about each of this step, but here is a model flow that we can see. First we will pre-process the sample, then we will generate the embeddings, then we'll generate some attention masks, pass them everything into the transformer base transform models encoder. And the output of the encoder is passed to the uh, heads, like whether it's a classification or pre-training. And then we'll finally post-process the output as, uh, as required. And the forward pass actually outputs a dig string tensor. And the string will be maybe scores and then uh, the tensor will be the output scores for the different, the classification problem. So let's uh, dive into the model now. So most of the code is uh, already uh, like well well commented. So uh, we can also we can also like uh, read through it and uh, understand what each particular section is doing. So let's uh, focus on the important ones. So the build encoder method here. So here we are building the image encoder and initializing it with the image encoder class that we had built earlier in the previous section. Similarly, building build embeddings. We are using the MMF transformer embeddings that we have built earlier. And next is the build the heads. So here we, for this task, it's a classification type of problem. So we have an image and a question, and we want to do a classification over the answer space. So we are building, we'll build a classifier here. So classifier is an sequential, which takes a bird puller. So we are using a bird puller, which is a, a pooling layer, which is used by BERT, uh, and then a BERT model. And so since we our transformer base is a BERT model, we'll use the same. And then we have a dropout and then a BERT prediction at transform. So it's basically a, a linear layer followed by an activation and then a layer norm. So activation can be in GELU, RELU, um, or like 10H. 
So, and then lastly, we'll have a linear layer, which will, um, which will just project the hidden output uh, into the number of uh, classification labels that we need, or there are there in the answer space. So the next important uh, uh, method is the pre-process the sample. So uh, here we are trying to standardize the inputs to the, our base, uh, sorry, uh, the inputs to our transformer base model. So the way we are trying to do it is, we define this base transformer input type object. So which takes in like input IDs and which takes in position IDs, which takes in segment IDs and masks for all the different types of modalities. So in just in case you want to define a new model, which has more than say two modalities of text and image, you can still use these, um, these base transformer input type object and um, pass on your modalities into these different uh, IDs and by just um, adding them or um, adding them to the, their dictionaries. So we, we build a different type of um, IDs here in this, in this method. And, and, and then we'll just uh, create a base transformer input type object and return it from here. And let, let's next go to the uh, forward pass. So first we'll pre-process the sample and we'll pass this output to our embeddings layer. And then we get the embedding outputs. And then we also generate the attention mask. So attention mask in this case will be same uh, for, uh, because we are not actually masking anything. And um, since it's a classification task and we are not doing any mask modeling for pre-training or anything. And then uh, we'll pass these em embedding outputs as well as the attention mask to our transformers encoder. So the encoder will uh, return us like the different outputs uh, or like we, what we call is the, the encoder layers. So, and then um, we actually use, uh, so in the BERT models, we actually use the output of the, uh, the CLS token um, and encoder layer and which is the, actually the first one. So we'll pass that uh, to our classify, classification layer. So the classification layer will give us some um, output, which will be actually the scores for like the different, um, different labels we have in our answer space. And then we'll post-process that output using the post-process output method. So here um, we are just um, like, change reshaping our output, but we can also, if you want to also apply some type of new losses or anything, you can do it here. And the output of this forward pass is a dig string tensor. So, and in this case, it's a string is scores and the, the tensor is like the output scores. So here uh, we have finished uh, like <clears throat> defining our class, sorry. Um, Next, let's move on to the important thing of how we can uh, specify the configurations for this model. So MMF transformer, um, so what we'll do here is we are actually building a dictionary and then we're saving it as a YAML file. So MMF takes in, yeah, we can use YAML files um, when we run the experiments or like inference and then and the different CLI commands will can take these uh, files as input. So we are specifying this dictionary where we are specifying different type of parameters for the model. So as we discussed earlier, the transformer base will be a bird base and case type, which is basically a bird base model. And our model will automatically load that model from Hugging Face library and with the, along with the pre-trained weights. Then there are some other important parameters like say the image encoder, where we specify what type of encoder we need and also different type of parameters for that, like how many output features or what is the pooling type we want to require for that. Then we have the experiment configuration or also user configuration as Aman uh, already mentioned in his configuration slides. So here we, um, basically it's the configuration for your experiment or like the particular task you are currently doing. So we specify different types of configuration say for schedulers or also like optimizers or like different type of training parameters. So one thing important to note here is that um, 
as we mentioned earlier that we'll be using a bird based um, encoder for the text text part so here since okv okay, data set by default has a text processor which takes uh, a glove text processor so we need to override it with a bird tokenizer or a bird based uh, encoder so we do this in order to um, so since our trans or our model is using a bird model so we use the same tokenizer for it because it will have the same vocabulary so we can override that here in our user or experiment config we also specify some specific configurations for our model which is like the number of labels in our answer space and also like type of loss we want to apply which is a logit bc loss and similarly we'll save this uh, as a yaml file so that we can run our experiments so next section is running the experiment so i won't run the experiment since since it will take like a lot of time to finish it so but you can run it and see how the model trains and uh, next is like the inference on the validation set so we have already provided a pre-trained model so which we have trained with exactly the same configuration that's available uh, that is uh, given here so if you train a model you'll get the you should get the uh, the same model so we are providing it here uh, and uh, it's already downloaded in my runtime and we can run the inference on the validation set so um, i will also leave it to you to run it um, because it takes a little bit of time so next what we'll see is how we can do uh, some evaluation on some test samples from the okv okay data set so first we'll just build some uh, necessary configuration processors and uh, load the state dict to the model and then we'll uh, so uh, once since it's running so then we'll what we'll do is we'll uh, pass in a image url and also the accompanying text and we'll see what the model uh, answers So here is the uh, image. So it's a, it's a horse and the question was, which sport requires riding on the animal depicted? And the model answer is race. So I think it's pretty reasonable answer. So um, we come to the end of the tutorial here. I'll move back to the slides. So uh, as we see, we can build the different data sets and models with MMF pretty easily because MMF provides all the building blocks that are required to build these models. So MMF comes with like endless possibilities and we already have like a lot of research being built on top of MMF. So some of the examples are M4C, TextVQA, LoRa, BUTD, and Pythia models. Also the Hateful Memes uh, challenge is now hosted on MMF. And there are some other papers like are we training it right, then text caps, and also we have some latest state-of-the-art models, uh, multimodal and transformer-based models like Visual Bird and Billboard implemented in MM. So thank you so much. Uh, if you are st stuck with us till the end of the tutorial, uh, thank you a lot. And um, so we uh, welcome everyone to uh, contribute to MMF and um, add your models, your new models and new data sets to MMF and help the community grow. So IMF has been possible due to a collaboration between a lot of teams and folks, both at Facebook as well as external. And we thank everyone. And here are some resources. Please visit the links. And also you can like run the tutorial again using the collab notebook that we have shared. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, are there any further questions? Last set of questions.
you can uh, unmute yourself if you have any questions uh, please feel free to ask them so it looks like uh, no further questions uh, so thank you all uh, so thanks a lot to all the presenters uh, uh, joe narain uh, maxim divats manpreet vedanuj uh, it was a great uh, tutorial and i hope uh, people find it useful please continue to engage with us uh, if you have any further follow ups uh, uh, so please reach out you can open github issues on the workshop or github itself okay so thank you very much thank you everyone for attending thanks you great job bye we can end the recording right jashwant yes uh, we can end the recording